and you're good to go. Well, good afternoon. And we'd like to go ahead and get the North Sonoma Valley Municipal Advisory Council meeting started. And the first thing that we're going to do is have the call to order. And then we're gonna have our Pledge of Allegiance and Hannah's going to share the flag with us. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. And to the to republic, republic for, which for which it stands, stands one, nation one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty and justice, justice for, all. for all. Actually, it's quite a day for the flag. A lot of, a lot of stuff going on international, and uh, so it's quite a day. Roll call, that's me also. And then let me get my roll call sheet. Arthur Dawson, chair, and Arthur is excused for this meeting. Damon Doss here. Kate Eagles? Here. Vicki Handron? Here. Mark Newhauser is excused on vacation. Matthew Dickey is excused at another meeting. Angela? Nardo Morgan? And uh, Jed Cooper, absent at this time. Okay, but we do have uh, four members of the council, so we do have a quorum, and that's wonderful. Uh, public comment limited to items not appearing on the agenda. And uh, Hannah, do you have the clock, or does that have go to Ariel, the two-minute clock? I do have the clock, um, but if you would like to ask if members of the public would raise their hand if they have a comment. Thank you very much. And so I will do so. Will the members of the public please raise their hand and so that Hannah can recognize you and give you some time. And I'm not seeing any hands at this time. All righty. Forgive me, I have forgotten already. That's a problem of working with somebody who's 74. Sometimes I do forget. Uh, was I supposed to read a comment from someone? That is correct. We did receive one written public comment. Um, if you would like to me to put up the timer slide and you read the first two minutes of it, does that sound good? That sounds perfect. All right, just give me one moment. Hello, supervisor. All right, so whenever you're ready, I'll go ahead and start that. Uh, now I'm confused. I thought it was gonna show up. Do I have it printed out or? Oh, yes, um, we, we emailed you the comment. Um, let's see, how would we, we best do this? Um, Why don't we go ahead and do the supervisor's comments and then come back to the one that, and I will bring it up. I apologize. For some reason, I thought it was gonna be on share screen. I apologize for that. That's my apology too. All right, um, we'll move on and then come back to that. Also, uh, and not to interject, but I did you officially approve the minutes? Um, did you ask for amendments to the minutes? Because I believe that is before public comment on matters not on the agenda. And you're absolutely right. Thank you, Ariel. So, can we have a, a motion to approve the minutes of May 19th, 2021? So moved. So moved by Vicki Hendren. And is there a, a second? second? Kate Eagles, um, Council Member Eagles, second. Any comment? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero. Uh, minutes of um, May 19th are approved. And we will return to public comment. I'm going to go fetch it. And then I'll be able to read the first two minutes. But Supervisor, we would uh, give you some time to uh, do your presentation. Thank you so much for being here. We have you on mute. 
you really didn't want to hear from me anyway. Oh yeah, um, yeah, we did. <laughs> we've been busy, busy, busy for the past week or so. Um, and thank you, Hannah, for preparing the e-newsletter that's going to go out, I believe, tomorrow, where we really write about the funding for roads from all of the various funds. And there are links that you can link on to figure out which roads are going to be paved with our regular funding from the general fund and SB1, as well as the roads that are going to be paved with the PGE settlement funds, uh, tier one, one plus, and two. And we sort of broke them up for decision making purposes. But uh, we're excited that some of our legacy roads like Cavedale and Trinity and Lawndale and Schultz and Bristol are going to be repaved from the debris cleanup damage that uh, they incurred. And so that is great, as well as some legacy issues, starting to work on the Donald Street Gap that has been a longstanding issue left over from the widening of Highway 101 through the Springs. This little section close to Donald Street, we're not exactly sure why it was omitted during the highway widening, but we're going to start design and working with Caltrans uh, to widen that. We'll have to require it uh, some right away and perhaps retaining wall to do that. So that newsletter will be going out tomorrow to all of you. If you don't receive my new my e-newsletter tomorrow, let me know and we will add you to the newsletter list. But um, I'm uh, very pleased that we took a straw vote this afternoon to approve tentatively approve a budget. We'll be reconciling everything from all of the various funds and fund balances that we have used to finance a budget for this year and we'll be coming back on Friday to formally approve the budget. But there are a couple of good things in that budget and the process that we use is the budget um, discussion starts long time ago. Uh, we do projections of what revenues look like, what the sales taxes look like, property tax, et cetera. So we have some idea about what our ending fund balances are from this year, as well as the projected revenues for the forthcoming year, we throw together a budget and we check in with the various departments, knowing that they're going to have to crunch down some numbers and maybe have some position cuts. And this year it was much easier than the, in my memory, I think, where we really did not have to cut significantly and we were able to add back a number of those positions in the sheriff's department and probation department so that we could have full strength going into next year. But the other um, opportunity that we have is looking at the American Rescue Plan Act money called ARPA money that we will have uh, funding decisions on that along with requests from the community, they'll come back in August to look at how we allocate. We Sonoma County received $96 million, which seems like a lot of money, but it's not really. Uh, $16 million of that off the top goes uh, for COVID expenses and financing, hopefully the last of the services provided uh, by Sonoma County. So that leaves us with about $76 million. Uh, and we'll look for the, the departments, we'll look to the community, and we will, uh, during our budget discussions, we identified a number of areas that would be appropriate for funding under ARPA, including uh, some funding from community investments, upstream investment uh, committee will we'll work with the community on that. Funding uh, daycare, for example, daycare positions, uh, maybe doing some one-time funding to bring facilities up to speed from the community. Uh, but we're also looking at ways that we could fund some of the legitimate expenses uh, under ARPA so that it didn't come out of the county one-time funding or general fund reserves. So we were able to achieve some successes. I worked with Chris Corsi on a couple of things. Uh, we each had eucalyptus trees that we needed to remove, and you know how ornery and big they are and expensive they are to cut down. So Chris put in a request to cut down uh, maybe 100 eucalyptus trees close to the rural cemetery. 
I put in a request to cut down maybe 30 eucalyptus trees on 8th Street East that was interfering with a potential bike path, walking path. And so both of those were funded out of the pg e settlement funds, as well as adding additional amount in case other districts needed to have some of those really big, outrageously expensive trees to come down. The other uh, success that we had is um, Bob Mol Molesworth and a couple of folks from Sonoma Valley worked on what it would look like and what it would take to finance the construction and design and construction of monument signs in front of our various fire departments. Looking at LD LED signs to warn folks about fire danger, power shutdowns, evacuation routes, um, and other uh, announcements of interest and emergency for the community. And uh, so we checked with Damon Doss and uh, Darren Bellick and thank you Darren uh, and Arthur for sending in letters of support and the board was persuaded uh, that we would allocate $500,000 for monument sites for not just Sonoma Valley, but open it up countywide. So we'll need to get busy and sending in requests for a couple of different signs. So Damon, you might get a monument sign in front of the Kenwood Fire Department and maybe the Glen Ellen, but another one is needed in front of the Agua Caliente uh, Fire Department as well. So over a couple of years, we may get those signs to really inform the community about what's important. The other item that Chris Corsi and I worked on is relocation of the archives. A number of the folks on here have expressed concerns about the uh, viability and the, the safe storage of the county, city of Sonoma, and special collections archives at Los Gulagos. Uh, just by the luck of the draw, I guess, or firefighters, we were able to save those archives, but it was increasingly apparent that we needed to move the archives. So we've been working with the Historical Records Commission and the library system to figure out a short-term and perhaps a longer-term solution. So in discussions with the library, they are assuming ownership of all of the collections. They will pay for uh, the transportation and storage and maintenance and access of the collections. The county will finance the rent for a storage facility. Location to be determined because that's part of general services is to identify appropriate spaces. There are a couple of spaces that might be um, available and, and suitable for storage, but it's part of negotiations from the county. So we, we are going to move the archives before fire season, whenever that is. Um, it's getting earlier and earlier. There were fires all over the county today. It's amazing, including the Burger King <laughs> in Roseland. I mean, really, a Burger King? Charbroiled burgers coming up. <laughs> Uh, and so, and the, the roads were a success and the eucalyptus trees and the monument signs. So, and also the board gave us funding uh, to fund uh, the testing and uh, architectural design for the antenna for KSVY to be reloc located up on the mountain, Sleeping Mountain, I guess it's called, to expand their communications reach. Uh, and we know how important they are during emergencies. Everybody tunes in to what's happened locally. So those is the success stories. I wanna thank my colleagues for their support, but we also agreed to expend money for homeless services, uh, supports for agriculture. Uh, some of the dairy farmers are really struggling with a drought and there are probably other six other things that we could talk about, but those are of most relevance to Sonoma Valley. So I'll end my report. Sorry, it's a little long-winded, but we got some successes today. And, and one more thing, uh, since Damon is here and sharing and he probably can't talk about it. I did have a meeting with Damon and 
uh, August um, and Darren Bellick talking about the financial situation of Kenwood Fire Department. And you may or may not know that they have a structural deficit and they have, and it's really been an impediment for uh, them joining the coalition of fire departments under the consolidated Sonoma Valley Fire. So we did have a discussion today and I wanna thank you, Damon, for quantifying exactly what the financial needs are. And for your information, what we did say is that we're going to have a conversation with a certain amount of money, uh, maybe $2 million. Uh, we'll open it up to fire services to come up with a solution on ongoing funding or one-time funding for Bodega Bay and Kenwood and uh, the North County Fire Districts to come back. But uh, there will be, uh, Damon has said that they're probably going to go out for parcel tax in Kenwood in the fall and with for the 1100 parcels and it's all hands on deck to work on the revenue measure for the fire districts. Uh, maybe June of next year. So it'll be important for the MAC to stay abreast of that, how that moves forward. Thanks, Damon, for all of your work in the fire department. Supervisor, thank you. And thank you for the uh, excellent meeting with yourself and the administrator, Cheryl Bratton. It was good for us to hear and to hear of the county support and interest in what's happening in Kenwood, Glen Ellen, Sonoma Valley, and the fire district. And also just to comment, we are in the fire season. There's no question about it. Uh, those folks who, uh, uh, who are there for firefighting have already geared up. Uh, the equipment's ready. The equipment's all uh, ready to go. And um, we're here. We're there. There's no question about this. It's very early in tomorrow. We're looking at, what, 100 degrees tomorrow. So luckily, no wind, uh, hopefully, of uh, any great magnitude. This is where I forget exactly. Do we uh, uh, have an opportunity for anybody on the council to ask questions or comments to uh, Supervisor Gore's uh, presentation? Is anybody with any comments or? And do we ask the public? I forget now, do we ask the public? Okay, if there's any comments or, or questions from the public for the supervisor. Yes, usually you have the uh, council member questions um, and discussion followed by the public comment. Okay, well then I'm, I'm, I think I've asked for the council member questions or comments and I didn't see any hands raised. And so, uh, Hannah, do we have any hands raised in the public? And um, yes, we have one hand raised at this time. So I'll go ahead and put up the timer slide and um, unmute them. Just give me one moment. All right. And to our commenter, you should now be able to unmute and you'll have two minutes. Hi, this is Katie Christ. I just had a couple of um, comments and one question. Um, one is about the, just following up to see if there was any response regarding the intersection at um, southbound Highway 12 and Arnold Drive where the collision happened last fall. And the other thing um, that I live on Hill Road and We've been inundated with PG&E um, subcontractors over the last year coming and cutting trees. And this last, um, this week we had, um, they've been blocking our narrow street with their trucks. And we've also just have a lot of concerns because we've had a couple of medical calls this week and they absolutely would not have been able to get past um, in any sort of timely way um, with the PG&E vehicles there. So I just was hopeful. It's my understanding that the permit that was issued by the county to pg e did not require them to give any kind of notice to us um, as residents as to when they would be coming. And um, I would might suggest that perhaps in the future that that would be a stipulation for a permit that some kind of notice, even just a week um, that it that it might happen, but just they show up randomly and kind of sometimes come for days at a time. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
is there another uh, comment from the, and did you want to respond to that, Supervisor Gore? Oh, go ahead, let's listen to all the comments and then I'll respond if there are any more. Okay, thank you. And there is one more um, commenter, just give me one moment. I didn't see that when I took away our timer slide. All right, and our commenter, you should now be able to unmute yourself and you'll have two minutes. Okay, yes, yeah, Supervisor Gorin. Uh, this is Larry Davis. Uh, I'm concerned that we need to increase the funding for the fire districts in general in order to take care of this uh, fire season and the next and the next and the next and the next and the next. That something's going on now. The, the great thing that's doing in fire preparation is one thing, but it seems like that there's two channels going on here, a, a civic action with the neighborhoods and fire preparation and so forth, and then a fire action. And it would seem that it would be nice, I, I hate to suggest the, uh, that we, it's the opposite of defunding the police. I'm saying we increase the funding for the fire department to increase their functionality in readying the public to deal with the fire seasons on a chronic basis as a public funding thing. I, right now we're in an emergency mode where we're taking a lot of money that's falling from the sky almost in terms of getting everybody active and doing prevention and doing all this kind of thing. But that funding isn't gonna last after a while. And do we, do we have a way to begin to think about increasing the amount of money we put into all the fire districts and increasing their functionality so that they can be the ones that are training and educating the public on an ongoing basis about how to deal with these kinds of issues because it seems like we're not we're not making the best use of the experts the fire people and we're building a whole nother bureaucracy of public servants that are going to go in and help with the preparation but i'm not sure that those two entities couldn't join and be funded together somehow. I'm, you know, I, I think CAL FIRE is doing fantastic, but they seem to have funding right now and Kenwood doesn't. And, you know, do you, you get the gist of what I'm saying? Thanks, Larry. Thank you, Larry. Thank you very much. Is there any on, anyone else with a comment? And I see no further hands raised at this time. Uh, and thanks. First of all, Katie, let me comment to you. Um, I did make a note that I need to connect with Johannes and Caltrans regarding that intersection. And you and I chatted about the fact that we both know uh, Scott and very concerned about the accident that happened there. So I'll follow up. Johannes has been just a little busy with budget and uh, the, the contracting out for the roads and vegetation management issues, but I will make a note and we'll talk with them about that, it's important. Uh, secondly, also Katie, thank you and to several of your neighbors for commenting about the challenges that you've had accessing or getting out of Hill Road with pg &E straddling across the width of the road. And thank you, Ariel, for responding to the neighbors. While I've been in budget hearings, Ariel has been researching uh, pg &E to figure out how we can make a difference. Ariel, are you here? Can you comment on what it is that you found? Yeah, so um, the way that the permit works is pg &E gets one permit for the whole county. Um, I did hear from one of your neighbors that I guess pg &E used to notice the neighbors or just let them know out of kind of courtesy. So I will certainly um, mention that to my, uh, to my contact at pg &E. I don't think it, I don't think it could be in the permit just because they're getting one permit for the whole county to work in the county right of way. But we can certainly ask them to be better neighbors. Um, but they, they should be finished with that work as of today. Um, so if they have anything to finish up, they may still be there tomorrow. I haven't heard that though. I, I, they should be done after today. So um, we are just so, so sorry for that um, unfortunate incident and, and the impact it had on the neighbors. Um, but they did say that 
you know, if there was a, a first responder vehicle or an ambulance or, or an emergency, they certainly would have gotten out of the way um, right away and let that pass through. Thanks, Ariel. I appreciate that. And that is of concern to everybody. We both want them to take care of vegetation that might potentially start a fire. And at the same time, we know how narrow the roads are in Glen Ellen and elsewhere. And it's very, very difficult to share the road with those very large vehicles. And finally, Larry, um, I get your point about fire services, and that's exactly what we're doing. We do rely on the experts, as Damon will attest uh, to the fact that we have, what is it called, the leadership group from the fire districts meet monthly. Uh, Steve Aker is part of that group. Uh, uh, Darren Bellick uh, shows up to that group. And they um, meet and talk about funding issues. And one of the key issues that we're working on is consolidation because we have a smattering of volunteer fire de departments, such as my commas, that we want to merge with larger entities so that we have the benefit of of staffing and upstaffing where it needs to happen. And previously, my commas fire did join Sonoma Valley Fire, and now we want to make sure that Kenwood is part of that. Ben, uh, Bennett Valley Fire has joined with Sonoma Fire, and so that consolidation has occurred, but we have districts out in the West County and districts in the North County that are currently working together to figure out consolidation strategies. But that's part of the one-time funding and ongoing funding that we're contemplating and going to bring back to the board to raise all of the boats so that they can be part of the consolidations. And all of them have made a commitment to work towards passing the fire service revenue measure uh, the first one failed. We didn't have enough boots on the ground, uh, but Damon was very good in analyzing the vote totals of that previous effort. Kenwood and Sonoma Valley Fire absolutely supported it, but the urban districts did not. So if we're talking about uh, fire, if we're talking about sustainable funding for fire districts, all of us need to come together to help fund uh, the fire services to be the level that we need them to be to protect us and uh, aid us during evacuations and fighting the fires. And I'll just turn it over to Damon if you want to add anything more to that. Well, as, uh, stay tuned as we look at another potential Measure G, which is the one that failed, or something like Measure G. And it will be very important for us to do good education. And as the supervisor said, uh, make sure that all of the fire districts are in full support and out there letting their citizens know of the importance. It is a countywide sales tax that is being uh, contemplated and would be around 50 million or something of that nature. But uh, we'll hear more about that as, it, as, as the details are worked out. And, are one last, and one last message to me before I put myself on mute. And that is the fact that we have issued heat advisories. If you haven't figured it out, we're hot. Um, <laughs> it's like 95 in Oakmont and I'm not sure what it is in Sonoma Valley. Uh, we're talking about opening cooling centers, but so far we haven't made the decision to open cooling session uh, centers. But the good news is we just had a ribbon cutting for the Sonoma Valley Vets building with a generator. So we will be able to open that facility during evacuations, power shutdowns, and real extreme heat events. And that's exactly what we're doing is looking at public buildings for resilience centers moving forward. Please check in with your friends, your neighbors, your older neighbors, your pets. Uh, everybody needs water, wet washcloths, anything that we can do to cool our bodies off. We don't wanna have uh, anybody being felled by the heat. And uh, so thank you for checking in. Very good. Well, with your condolence, uh, well, I will go now to the original comment uh, from the public comment that I was going to read, and I will ask uh, Hannah to put up the two minutes. Yes, and before we return to item number three, um, Vice Chair Doss, um, I want to acknowledge that Councilmember Cooper is in attendance by phone. Um, so if 
you want to chime in and press star six just to let us know he's here. What I have in front of me is a, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. What I have in front of you is a document uh, from SC, SDC Redevelopment titled, We Live in Glen Ellen. It is a uh, 29 page document with lots of signatures. I'm not gonna read every signature, but I am going to read uh, the actual uh, body of the, of the uh, document. We, the undersigned, wish to convey that we are Glen Ellen residents. There seems to be some confusion as we consistently see our neighborhoods south of Sonoma Development Center referred to as Eldridge, which is not our legal address. For all purposes, we want it understood and acknowledged that we live in Glen Ellen and, and that Eldridge has historically been the Sonoma Developmental Center. Since the SDC property is completely surrounded by Glen Ellen, the redevelopment should be considered part of Glen Ellen and not a separate entity. Please ensure that all neighborhoods south of SDC are identified as Glen Ellen, as reflected in our legal addresses. We should be included in all references to Glen Ellen, not excluded. Thank you. And it's signed uh, like it goes on for uh, almost 30 pages with uh, two or three signatures per page. And I'm not going to read each of the signatures, but each of those signatures is accompanied by the identical um, uh, letter to, to our group. Is there anything else on the uh, public comment that I need to do at this time, Hannah? Would you like to reopen the live public comment um, since we circled back to it to see if anyone uh, of the attendees would like to comment? Well, that sounds like an excellent idea. So we are going to reopen that. All right. Um, if anyone who's in uh, attendance would like to make a comment, please raise your hand in the Zoom app or press star nine if you're joining by phone. And I'm not seeing any hands at this time. Thank you. Is the phone number on, on my screen, is that uh, uh, Council Member Cooper? Yes, I tried to introduce him earlier, um, but yes, he is joined. Hello, Jared. Good to hear you. Excuse me, Vice yeah, Chair Doss. You. Oh, he's back. Okay, I was going to say that he's having trouble unmuting, but you're there. Thank you. Jared? Thank you, Kate. Hi, Jed. Hi. As the uh, supervisor noted, uh, it's hot outside and we are in a draw. And our next subject uh, could not be more timely local drought emergency declaration and a presentation by the Sonoma Water. And Hannah, do you have their connect? They are being uh, promoted to um, present to us right now. Thank you. Marcus, are you with us? Are you guys ready? Up, oh, you're on. You're on mute, at least on my screen. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Now, now I hear you. Thank you, Marcus. Okay, sorry about that. Um. Great. Can you see the, uh, is the presentation showing up for you in full screen here? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Um, we can actually, sorry to interrupt, um, we can actually see your presenter notes as well, the next slide. Bit. Let me try this. How's that working? Uh, I think that works. It's just a big cracked earth picture. Okay. Um, hopefully you can see the full slide if I advance it. No, so just go back to it with the with the notes. It's fine. Sorry about that. I uh, 
am not used to doing the uh, the share screen apparently. Um, let's see, now how do I switch back? Okay, I'm over here. Okay. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me here this evening. Um, I'm uh, Marcus Trott, I'm a principal hydrogeologist with uh, the Sonoma Water. And I'm here to give a, a short uh, update on uh, our drought conditions, which uh, as, uh, as you indicated are, are quite uh, serious this year. And um, what I want to kind of cover is kind of put the, the current drought in, uh, in context with some of our historical droughts um, and uh, this one is really um, pretty much at, at the historic lows when we look at uh, our long-term uh, records within the region, both our reservoir storages as well as our, our rainfall totals. And uh, the graphic that's shown on the, on the right there is actually on our, on our website and it's uh, updated every day showing how we compare um, currently with historical rainfall as well as our, our storage levels. You can see that um, you know, in the Russian River watershed in Santa Rosa and, and Ukiah, we're right around 39% uh, of our historical uh, rainfall. And our storage and, and our two main reservoirs, which I'll, I'll show um, in a couple slides, Lake Sonoma, which is our, our main reservoir in terms of the water that, that Sonoma Water provides to our, our customers, which are mostly our uh, urban and, and municipal purveyors in, uh, in the Santa Rosa and uh, Sonoma Valley and, and Petaluma Valleys, is at about 56%. <clears throat> and Lake Mendocino, which is uh, further upstream in the watershed and is really more, more critical for users between um, Lake Mendocino between the Ukiah area and, uh, and Healdsburg along the Russian River is at about 38%. Um, and both of our reservoirs are, are as low as they've ever been since they've been constructed, um, to, to put that in context. Um, also provide a, an overview of some of the, um, the things we're doing in response to the drought, um, including our water shortage uh, planning, water conservation messaging that, that's going out. We've uh, recently got, um, had uh, um, some, what we call uh, temp temporary urgency change um, petitions approved by the, the State Water Resources Control Board that has allowed us to uh, reduce some of the uh, um, flows coming out of the reservoirs um, and uh, allowing us to save what water we do have um, for the, uh, the summer and, and fall months, um, just in case we, we have another dry year next year. And then uh, we've also done some innovative work in terms of forecasting um, during the, the winter season that has allowed us to uh, preserve uh, water in those, in at least Lake Mendocino where we've done um, some of that work initially and I'll, I'll provide a, a description of that um, forecast informed reservoir operations. So, and then we have a big uh, public awareness campaign um, that, that we've been launching and, uh, and, and, and trying to get the, the message out to our, our customers and, and others within the region. So one thing that's really important to, to understand is that um, the uh, drought vulnerabilities and, and impacts from drought are really felt differently um, throughout the county from different users, depending upon the location and, and circumstances and, and water supply um, that those uh, that, that individuals and, and communities have. Um, you know, our surface water supplies that I described, Lake Sonoma. And Lake Mendocino, um, you know, very different in terms of, of potential impacts. Lake, Lake, Men, Lake Sonoma is a much larger reservoir, and Lake Mendocino is, is a much smaller um, reservoir and, uh, and doesn't have as much carryover capacity. Um, groundwater, which is actually the, the world that I'm, I'm generally uh, working in, is, uh, is also quite variable throughout the county. Um, there are some areas, particularly in, in southern Sonoma Valley, where we have um, historic um, areas of groundwater depletion where droughts can, can cause even more significant impacts. And uh, you know, what I'm primarily working on at Sonoma Water is working on behalf of these new groundwater sustainability agencies, developing um, plans and, 
and Supervisor Gorin is a is a um, chair of the, the board of, of that agency in, in Sonoma Valley, which covers the Sonoma Valley groundwater basin. And we're working on developing a plan um, to that will also help develop solutions to make um, improve the sustainability of groundwater conditions in, uh, in the basin, doing things like recharge projects that can also help us address future droughts in, in, in terms of having you know, kind of a, a more than one source of water. Um, it's really important to where you can have a, a diverse portfolio of water supply sources, surface water, groundwater, recycled water is also an important component in some areas. Uh, the other thing I wanna highlight is that there's really not one agency countywide that manages all water supplies. Um, you know, so we have different approaches by the, the counties and the, and the cities and, and the various water districts. However, um, with this drought, there has been, I, I think, kind of an increased focus on, on coordinating amongst all the, the different, you know, county agencies, Sonoma Water, uh, the county, our cities and, and water districts have really been in close communication and trying to, um, you know, be supportive and, and help each other out and, and develop consistent messaging and tools for people to um, get through this drought. Um, and then, you know, there's also rural residential and agricultural users that, that are generally, you know, not part of, of, of any particular water supply system, they often have their own water supply system in, in the form of their own individual wells. Um, and so that's, that's another um, vulnerability that, that's highly variable from place to place. Um, and then thinking about all, you know, not, not just, um, you know, uh, people that need water, but for, you know, drinking water recreation and, and irrigation, but, but ecosystems are also quite vulnerable to the times of drought, and uh, and that's a big uh, concern this year as well. So, um, just you know, the the area of, of really focus for for most of Sonoma Waters' um, interest is is the uh, the Russian River um, system, which uh, provides the the vast majority of the water that that Sonoma Water delivers to its customers. Um, the, uh, the river system in total uh, supplies water to more to 700,000 people, farms and businesses throughout the watershed. Um, and that includes about 600,000 people that, that Sonoma Water um, delivers water to um, through, its, uh, through its aqueduct system, which I'll, I'll show on the next slide. Um, you know, we, uh, Sonoma Water provides water to most of the urban areas, um, beginning kind of from Windsor down uh, to Petaluma and, and Sonoma Valley, as well as, uh, as uh, portions of Marin County, um, Novato and, and uh, Marin Municipal Water District. Um, that water is uh, sourced um, primarily from Lake Sonoma, which uh, where water flows down through Dry Creek and, uh, and enters the, the, the Russian River. And then Sonoma Water has a number of facilities out on the river near Forestville, where we divert that water through uh, what are known as uh, collector wells. These are large capacity wells that, that divert that, that water. Um, by using wells, we're able to um, utilize kind of a natural filtration of the sands and gravels beneath the river to improve the water quality. And then, as I mentioned, Lake Sonoma, which you see in the, the very northern portions of the, of the watershed is also a very important feature, which, which uh, Sonoma Water has, uh, has uh, interests in and, and operates for, for water supply, um, is really critical to all of the, the cities and, uh, and businesses and farms along the Russian River, um, you know, through Mendocino County, as well as Northern Sonoma County. So it includes a lot of you know, wine grape growers, cities of, uh, for example, Cloverdale, uh, Ukiah are reliant on those Russian River supplies. And the, the, that, those areas in this drought are, are, are being particularly hard hit because of, of, uh, of the very low levels at, at Lake Mendocino. And just uh, yesterday, the State Water Resources Control Board um, issued, uh, I think, regulations um, curtailing water rights for, uh, for all water users along 
that reach of the along the Russian River water system in order to preserve what water we can. Um, so just some context on, on this drought in comparison with historical droughts, you can see we're, we're, uh, we're at the lowest level here. Um, 2021 is, uh, is you know, quite a bit lower when we look at the storage levels at, at Lake Mendocino in comparison with, uh, with 1977, which was uh, previously our, our worst drought on record um, based on data going back to when the reservoir was constructed in, in 1959. And uh, you know, pictures are kind of worth a, a thousand words. You can see what that actually looks like on the ground, comparing a, a water year where we had uh, you know normal to wet conditions in, in 2019, and just two years later, um, you know, similar time of year, um, much different, uh, much different picture out there. Uh, Lake Sonoma, um, similar uh, to Lake Mendocino, is also. Um, at its historic low, uh, you can see the previous low in that um, reservoir was 1990. And uh, because it was constructed in uh, uh, more recently, um, we have less, less years of data that, incorpor that are incorporated in this slide. And then a uh, similar um, picture at that reservoir as well. So one thing uh, to, uh, to keep in mind is that um, oftentimes these significant droughts lead to um, you know, significant responses and, and kind of new initiatives. And uh, when we look back at, at in the historical uh, record and look at, at our prior droughts, starting with uh, 76 to 77, we can see um, you know, locally, um, there was a, a major project constructed, which was the construction of, of Warm Springs Dam was, uh, was completed uh, primarily in response to that drought. And that, that's the dam that, that forms Lake Sonoma, which is our, our, our main water supply um, system. Um, the 07 to 09 drought brought some new statewide uh, requirements, this uh, 20 by uh, 2022, 20 by 2020 uh, water conservation uh, plan, which was a requirement that um, uh, water users throughout the state, um, cities and, and uh, water systems reduce their water consumption by 20% in, in 2020. And in Sonoma County, we've been very successful in achieving that. I think our most recent uh, statistics show that we've reduced our, our water um, consumption uh, by 37% um, since that uh, 2009 time period. Um, the CASGEM, sorry for all the acronyms, um, but CASGEM is a, uh, another initiative that, that was a statewide um, requirement for groundwater level monitoring that, that came out of that, that 07 to 09 drought. And then uh, the Sonoma Marin Saving Water Partnership was a uh, kind of collaboration that Sonoma Water leads with, with many of our other um, customers in, in Sonoma and Marin County that was formed to basically implement and, uh, and achieve the, that 20% uh, percent water conservation requirement by the state. And that um, uh, collaborative has been very active uh, recently and, uh, and in terms of uh, getting the, the cons water conservation word out there. Um, the most recent drought before uh, the current one, uh, 2013 to 2016, uh, we got more acronyms. We got the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which is, uh, as I mentioned, is what I'm primarily uh, working on um, addressing and, and complying with for, uh, for Sonoma Water. Uh, FIRO is, is that forecast informed reservoir operation, which I'll, I'll share some information on in a couple slides. And then um, it also helped uh, develop uh, relationships and partnerships. And, and an example of that is this Upper Russian River Water Managers Group that has been meeting uh, since that drought to, to better prepare us for, for future droughts um, in the primarily the, the Mendocino and uh, Northern Sonoma County portions of the Russian River. And so we'll see what 2020 and uh, 2021 drought uh, come, to, uh, come to bring is, is something that we're 
we're, we're looking at in, in terms of, of looking at, at opportunities for, you know, maybe obtaining state funding to do, for example, additional, you know, groundwater recharge project projects and, and things that can help improve our resiliency uh, to future droughts. Um, so, you know, just a, a summary of some of these, uh, these tools that I'll, I'll, I'll I think I've described most of these um, in detail, the forecast informed reservoir operation, uh, these temporary urgency change petitions that, that we submit to the state board that allow us to reduce the required minimum in-stream flows on the Russian River. Um, and uh, th those allow us to maintain what water we can in our reservoirs. And uh, a, a new requirement from the state also um, as part of our urban water management plans is to develop these regional conservation and, and water shortage contingency plans. So those are things that, that will, will help us in, in future events and then our, our public outreach uh, campaigns are, are in full swing right now. Oops. So um, in terms of the, the reservoir management, um, this uh, Forecast informed reservoir operations is a is a a, a way to help um, is is essentially developing better tools and information to better forecast when we're going to get storms during the winter months, um, so that we can preserve water in that reservoir um, when we we think that. Uh, that we don't need to necessarily uh, dump water out um, if there's no imminent flooding that's coming. And so that's something that, that Sonoma Water has been kind of on the cutting edge of, uh, of developing and, and now it's being applied and, and tested in, in many other areas of the state. Um, and so it really helps balance our, our you know, water supply um, needs during future droughts with also the need to, to minimize uh, future flood risks. And uh, the, the kind of the, the work behind it is, is using improved weather and hydrology forecasting to, to really determine whether or not to, to, when to make those releases from reservoirs based on actual forecasted conditions. Um, so what that uh, can do for us and has done for us in, in Lake Mendocino this past year is kind of shown on this slide. Um, which shows the, the storage level um, in, a, in Lake Mendocino um, throughout a year. And this shows water year um, 2013 to 2014, where um, the, the actual level in the, in the reservoir is shown by the blue line. And what the orange line is showing is what the US Army Corps of Engineers, which operates the reservoir for flood control, has been using uh, to determine whether or not to hold water or release water. And as you can see, it's, it's, it's a very rigid line. And so when this blue line during the winter goes above that orange line, um, they, they consider there to be a potential risk for, for future flooding. And so they'll, they'll dump water out of the, uh, of the reservoir um, and uh, to make room for, you know, future storms. Um, you can see in, in 2013, what happened was um, we had a big storm which brought the storage level of the lake up quite a bit. And then they dumped it. And uh, the, uh, you know, obviously that, that, that water all, all drained out to the ocean. But after that, that, that one storm, there were no other storms that, that came in. And so, uh, you know, we, we lost all that water. With forecast informed reservoir operations, if we look out here and we don't see any any storms that are imminent, um, we can. You, we're working with the, the the Army Corps to 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 keep that water in the reservoir so that um, you know it can be there for uh, for future uh, for later that fall and, and in the summer. And in doing this, uh, I think it was. Uh, Two years ago, we were able to save about 11,000 acre feet of water um, in Lake Mendocino. Um, the, uh, the messaging and, and, uh, and, and outreach, um, as I mentioned, is, is uh, uh, you know, uh, being implemented by the Sonoma Marin Saving Water Partnership and uh, their requirement for, uh, for the, the, you know, the overall water reduction 
um, we had a, uh, in order to get to that, that 20%, um, we needed to get down to 129 gallons per day. And uh, by 2020, we actually achieved 113 gallons per day in the region. And that's uh, been even lowered uh, since that time. Um, the other thing that this drought has brought about by the, the state board's um, um, uh, requirements as part of this, um, um, our, uh, our, our um, the, the order that, that, they, that they recently issued um, that allows us to, to reduce those um, releases from the reservoir and preserve that water includes a requirement that we, we reduce our diversions from the Russian River um, this year by, by 20%. So that's in addition to those, those previous savings in, uh, in, in water consumption. Um, we're, we're really doing a lot of outreach now. We've had a, a, a drought drive up where we've given away a lot of um, uh, uh, you know, tools for, uh, for residents to, to use to, to save water, uh, low flow shower heads and things like that. And uh, this is just kind of a summary of the, the things that I've already, uh, already covered. Um, so you know, what we really want to point out is that this is a very significant drought. Um, there's uh, um, the, the impact of it are felt differently in different areas. And uh, we have a lot of tools that, uh, that have been developed over the years from prior, prior droughts that uh, should help us get through it, but uh, it's gonna be really important that the messaging gets out uh, far and wide so that everybody knows just how, how serious it is. And then um, we have quite a bit of information on, on our website um, on uh, the current water supply conditions, as I mentioned, that's the link for that. And then uh, the Sonoma Saving Water Partnership has its own website where they've got a whole bunch of information on, on water saving uh, tips. So with that, I uh, ends my presentation and happy to, to take any, any questions. Well, thank you, Marcus. I have a quick question for you. Yeah. In regards to Lake Sonoma, uh, if there's a difference of opinion from the FIRO group and the Army Corps, who prevails? <laughs> well, during the winter, the, the Army Corps has uh, control of the, of the reservoirs. And so they, that, that's the way that, that the operation of those reservoirs work is, is during the, the winter months, Army Corps has the, the, really the final say. Um, and in the, the summer months, um, Sonoma Water has control for, for water supply um, releases. So we've been working very closely with the Army Corps of Engineers to to um, you know, uh, to, to develop this this Firo program, and uh, the the way that we've we've done it is is bringing in you know researchers from um, from from all over from uh, Scripps experts in in uh, in you know climate and um, hydrology, and uh, and kind of working hand in hand with the Army Corps to to test the um, the. Uh, the methodology and you know we first implemented it as kind of a pilot test and so they haven't yet i don't believe um changed their uh, actual operating rule curve to to uh to um incorporate fear but i think that's something that that uh, that that is on the horizon we're also um i think we've got some funding to extend uh Firo to uh lake sonoma or at least start planning for it and so that's uh that's something that'll be be really important as well. But uh, to answer, yeah, to answer your question, in those winter months, it's it's ultimately the the Army Corps of Engineers that, that has the the final say in terms of the of the releases. But um, we did work with them to uh, to to make some of those changes as a in a pilot uh, kind of pilot test format. Are there any other questions from council members uh, for Marcus? Well, I have one more if there's no one else has one. Uh, Kenwood is served by the Kenwood Pengrove Water Company primarily. On occasion, we have access to the aqueduct. Has the aqueduct line that goes down through Sonoma Valley ever been compromised? Um, 
It's definitely vulnerable um, to, you know, seismic events. Um, it's also been, um, uh, uh, I think there, there's, there may be some areas that, that, that have needed, you know, repairs um, from time to time. Um, and that's, that's something that, that we were definitely well aware of. And uh, that's one of the kind of the motivations for, you know, making sure, for example, we have a sustainable groundwater supply, you know, further to the, to the south and in the, the Kenwood area um, to, to help us get through any, you know, instances where that, you know, that, that aqueduct could potentially be uh, compromised. In the, uh, you know, the fires of uh, 2017, um, it was definitely a touch and go. Um, you know, given uh, um, the uh, the issues that the, that the fire caused, um, but uh, you know, it did make it through in terms of, of, of being there to provide the water when it was needed. Um, but it is definitely something that 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 is uh, uh, you know potentially at risk, and and uh, and we have a whole hazard mitigation plan to uh, to address that. Are there any other questions from council members? Uh, Nardo Morgan, Angela Nardo Morgan, please. Uh, yeah, hi, thank you, Marcus, for that really informative uh, presentation. I, I have a quick question. I think that we are, um, Sonoma Valley's under, uh, under voluntary um, water usage reduction. I think that perhaps Hillsburg is under mandatory. And if that's right, will Sonoma Valley be at some point under a mandatory water usage protocol? <laughs> I think, um, and uh, I might have to, to follow up to, to get a, a definitive answer, but I believe that the, the, the way it's working is that the, um, and again, it depends on, on where you're at. If you're a customer of the Valley of the Moon Water District or the city of Sonoma, um, you know, the, the requirement from the state is that you know, those um, is that Sonoma water reduces its diversions from the Russian River by 20%. Um, that can in part be made up for by their local supplies, whether it's groundwater supplies. And so um, there may not be a, a mandate for everyone to reduce their water usage by, by 20%. But overall, we need to cut diversions. And so it's likely going to be a combination of, of, you know, conservation, and, um, and, and other water sources. And so I think it, it may be up to the individual, you know, water purveyors as to whether they make it mandatory or not. Healdsburg is again in, in, uh, in more dire straits than, than we are here in Sonoma Valley because of their location, you know, above the, the, the uh, uh, Lake Sonoma um, water supply. Thank you. Are there any other questions from council members? Uh, Councilman Eagle, Council Eagles. Thank you. Yeah, following up on uh, Council Member Nardo Morgan's question, is is that just typical? You 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 have a a potential patchwork of of water uh, conservation mandates or suggestions in underneath the the, uh, the Sonoma water umbrella. I, I I don't know this 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 area very well. And I, I would seem to me that at some point we're all in this, in this together kind of thing and everyone would have similar requirements, but that is what I'm understanding is that that's just not how it works. And uh, you, that's, uh, you know, the various jurisdictions um, in city and counties may have different requirements for their residents. Can, can you speak a little bit more on that? And, and thank you, Marcus. Uh, I, I, concur, I concur, it was a very good presentation. Thank you. Oh, great, thank you. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, when it comes down to it, each, each jurisdiction, you know, does have, um, you know, some of its own, um, you know, authorities and, and, uh, and flexibility. Um, I will say that um, there, there certainly has been an increased, um, you know, emphasis, you know, through that Sonoma Marin Saving Water Partnership Collaborative to, um, you know, to, to try and keep things, you um, um, you know, a little more balanced throughout the, uh, the different jurisdictions. And, you know, the, the county also, um, when they did their drought declaration, um, put out a, uh, 
uh, you know, a request for um, all, you know, unincorporated area residents to, to um, conserve by, by 20%. Um, you know, again, it's, it's not a, a, a mandate or, um, or anything like that. But um, in terms of the messaging, um, there, there definitely is a, 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 you know, an emphasis on, on trying to, to keep things consistent. But, um, you know, on the, on the other side, um, there is a, there, because of the, the very, you know, diverse situations um, and, and water supply um, sources throughout the county, um, you know, the, it, it does lend itself to, to, you know, potentially different different requirements and different responses um, based on what supplies are available by each individual jurisdiction. Some have, you know, more robust groundwater supplies or, or other, you know, types of, of, uh, of uh, conservation programs that, than others. Any other questions? Oh, uh, uh, Council Member Hendren, please. Yes, hi, thank you for the great presentation. Um, I'm just curious, how do private wells factor into the equation? Is there any groundwater monitoring to see the, um, to see how the impact of, of the levels of groundwater might impact private wells? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's primarily what I've uh, been working on uh, since I joined Sonoma Water uh, 13 years ago. Um, and here in Sonoma Valley, we even before that um, uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, that state uh, requirement for, uh, for groundwater sustainability came to effect, which was in 2015. Um, as, as early as 2008, um, there was a, a voluntary groundwater management um, program and plan that was, was developed um, that included uh, the Kenwood area um, and, and, and Glen Allen, the entire Sonoma Creek watershed was uh, it covered by that plan. And there was a, quite a bit of, of um, groundwater level monitoring that, that, that's been uh, developed through that program, volunteered, um, you know, voluntary monitoring. And so that's data that, that's been collected um, by, uh, by volunteers in, in the Kenwood area. Um, there's actually quite a few wells that, that, are, that are monitored and have been monitored um, for the past 10 years ago that, that provide us, uh, you know, a good indication of, of how you know, wells have responded in uh, in different uh, different areas to some of the some of the droughts we have experienced during that time, um, and uh, so there is some some close monitoring of groundwater levels, and we are seeing in in some areas, um, you know, groundwater levels are also at uh, at historic lows at this time, so it is a uh, very important to to continue to track and and, and monitor uh, groundwater levels. Any other questions from council members? Do we have any public comment? Yeah, Marcus, you could, oh, go ahead. I'm just gonna say Marcus could probably uh, stop sharing at this point. Yes, that would be great, thank you. And we do have one hand raised. So as soon as I can share my screen, I'll get the timer slide up. Thank you. All right, and our first commenter, you should be able to unmute yourself and you have two minutes. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is Jay Gamble. I'm with the Kenwood Press watching you guys tonight. And this is a fascinating presentation. Thank you, Marcus. I appreciate it. And uh, Member Handron brought up uh, something that I'm really sort of growing more and more concerned with. I live up Adobe Canyon or did before my house burned down. And I had a well, which is right on Sonoma Creek, which I felt very comfortable with since it was so high up on the water chain. Uh, however, the house next door has gone dry, their well, which was not as quite as deep as mine, nor well, as close to the creek. I guess my question is, as a concerned homeowner, as well as a news person, is are there any uh, precautions in, or, or help being developed for ongoing failure of wells in the urban area out here, because I know a lot of people like me, we're not, 
I'm not having three or four homes out here and don't have a deep well of finances to reach into to replenish my well if it went dry. Is there going to be any help on the on the on the future for urban well owners who go dry? And to either how are we going to get water? Do we have to come over and tap onto the aqueduct? Have it trucked in? Uh, what what are our options going to be? Is there any uh, action or motion going on at the state? Or, or the county level to see that we have some help in, in, in maintaining our water supplies uh, in the light of this ongoing groundwater depletion. It's God knows it's been going on for years. And as you noted, very well recorded in Kenwood. And thank you, all you people out there in Kenwood who participated in this program. Uh, the Kenwood Press helped make that known to people and get them in there. So that, that's my question. What, what help is on the horizon for uh, urban people who's wells go dry. What do they do? What are they going to do? How can you help them? Yeah, that may be you or Susan Gorin. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Vice Chair Das, I do not see any other hands at this time. Well, in response to that comment, do you have any comment, Marcus? I would say that um, you know, in the uh, um, in terms of the, uh, um, the the groundwater sustainability agency that that's formed, you know, that you know, developing the information as well as uh, potential you know projects and, and and actions that can that can help you know mitigate those uh, those conditions where where wells may go dry is uh, is is what's is what's being developed within the the Sonoma Valley. Uh, groundwater basin, you know, we're required to set what are known as minimum thresholds in, uh, in, uh, in the basin for, for groundwater levels. And, uh, you know, part, some of the considerations that were taken into the main consideration that were taken into account is, uh, is in terms of setting those minimum thresholds is making sure that groundwater levels um, remain above historical um, lows and or don't um, get to levels that uh, would, uh, would impact nearby wells, you know, neighboring wells, residential wells, uh, agricultural irrigation wells, water supply wells, um, and, uh, and the groundwater agencies are uh, gonna be required to you know, develop any projects and actions needed to, to avoid those conditions you know, the Kenwood area that, that you're speaking in of is, is actually outside of, uh, of the state defined groundwater basin. And so um, the, the resources um, or, you know, the projects and actions, um, while they're not required to, to address those areas, um, we are including in, in, our, in our plan, at least in terms of, um, you know, monitoring groundwater conditions, as well as potentially considering, you know, projects and actions uh, for areas that are outside of the basin, because you know Kenwood is connected to the uh, the Sonoma Valley Basin hydrologically, and so there you know is a benefit to the the, the Sonoma Valley Basin to have sustainable groundwater conditions in in, in Kenwood as well. Um, in terms of impacts from a, an acute drought like this, that's that's a little harder for the uh, these groundwater agencies to. Kind of respond to, um, and uh, as they're required to achieve sustainability on kind of a longer on a longer time scale. Um, but I think there are you know tools that that have been uh, uh, developed. The state has a kind of a, a water shortage reporting um, um, program that they've developed um, that uh, I think we have some some links to on our on our website so that we. Can get a better understanding of, of kind of where wells are going dry. That's something that really hasn't been well reported historically in the state or in, in Sonoma County in the past. And so by understanding areas that are more vulnerable to, uh, to drought conditions, um, you know, that can, is something that can lead to improved, you know, future planning and as well as, as, as education opportunities. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll probably end there. Marcus, again, thank you so very, very much. And Hannah, do we have any other public comment? 
Uh, Damon, this is Susan um, and Jay. I'm sorry that your neighbor's well is going dry. Uh, we are, I think, overly reliant on wells for drinking water, irrigation water. Uh, we are the county, perhaps in California, with the highest number of wells, the largest number of wells. And that it just uh, points to the vulnerability that we have during extreme drought. We do have wells going dry. Many people have are forced to drill deeper wells, hopefully finding water at a lower level. But we collectively need to recognize the finite resources that we have in our surface water as well as groundwater. And that's the point of the groundwater uh, basin and the sustainability plan. But Kenwood, as Marcus pointed out, uh, is not part of that plan yet, but even if it were, the question remains to all of us, what would you expect the county to do? Uh, I know that people truck in water. The, um, uh, the dairy farmers in Petaluma are, um, are, the county is drilling a deeper well or reactivating a well to provide water perhaps for them, but they've been trucking water in uh, for a number of months. And that is what people are being forced to do uh, during the drought. No good answers. Thank you, Supervisor. Thank you, Marcus. And I think we'll go on to our next topic, which is uh, evacuation. So uh, thank you so much, Marcus. We appreciate it. So we're in a drought and we're in a fire season and we may need to evacuate. And has anybody got a plan? I think they do. I think we're gonna hear from the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office and the Sonoma County Department of Emergency Management. And we're gonna hear about the plan for Sonoma Valley. And uh, Hannah, who do we start with? We have um, Misty Wood joining us from the Sheriff's Office. And we have Dr. Nancy Brown joining us from the Department of Emergency Management. So which one of these fine folks are gonna go first? Anna, this is Misty. My recommendation is that Nancy goes first because she covers preparation. And the next log logical step is action from there, if that's okay with you all. Perfect, thank you. Alrighty, then I will take it away. Um, my name is Nancy Brown. I am the Community Preparedness Program Manager for Sonoma County's Department of Emergency Management. And um, Misty and I have been working very closely um, to talk about different subjects about evacuation. Um, she's gonna talk to you a little bit about the, the zones and some other things that the Sheriff's Department is doing as our um, partner who is in, actually in charge of evacuation. But of course, there's things that each and every one of us need to do prior to an evacuation so that we can ensure the safety of our family and be sure that we're ready to go should we be asked to leave. Uh, the Department of Emergency Management has developed a new tool and it's called an evac pack. And it's a really simple tool. It's, con it's a self-contained planning tool that once you complete this project, you can easily hang this in a convenient place like inside the closet door or a kitchen cabinet, whatever's close and easy for you to access. This tool includes an emergency plan template. So this is a really simple item for you. It really is just a fill in the blank. So we ask the questions and you write down the answers. Um, it comes in both English and Spanish and it gives you plenty of spaces to write things that are really important when you're trying to make a plan, including what your evacuation might look like. The other thing that has been really popular is we've developed an emergency evacuation checklist. And so this gives you an idea of if you need to leave right now, what you need to take. Um, if you have maybe 30 minutes before you need to leave, maybe there's a few other things you might in, add into that idea. And then if you have as long as an hour, um, what other things can you do, including preparing your home to help firefighters should they need to um, respond to your home to help put out a fire? So, so this checklist is part of that evac pack. Additionally, we have a um, sticker in there that's going to help you identify your zone and give a place to write it down so then you can just stick it on the pack. We have information in there about power outages. So this is information about tips, what to do before, 
during and after a power outage to help you stay safe and be prepared for that. And the whole thing wraps up with a nice little Velcro strip also to make it easy for you to hang it anywhere, um, super easy for you. So as I mentioned, these things are coming to you both in English as well as in Spanish. And you can pick these up at any Sonoma County library. So we have these um, in stock at the libraries. Um, when I'm done with my presentation, I will put in the chat a link so that you can read about the library's hours and how to pick things up if your library is not open yet, but it is open for pickup, how you can do that. Additionally, I would like to offer um, to any of you who are working in your neighborhoods with preparedness groups, if you would like a few of these items so that you can um, distribute them in your neighborhood, you are welcome to reach out to me and I can get you 20 or 30 or whatever that is you need so that you can go ahead and distribute those in your neighborhood because we need your help in helping everybody get ready. The second thing I'd like to talk about is a virtual opportunity. Again, this is a um, partnership with our Sonoma County Library partners, and we're doing a series of three virtual workshops on emergency preparedness. Now, the first one actually happened last Saturday. It was on emergency kits and go bags. The good news is it was recorded in both English and in Spanish, so you can um, go to the, the YouTube page. I'll put that in the link also and review that video. The next two, which are coming up on Saturday, June 26th, 6th, and then Saturday, July 10th, will be on um, making an emergency plan. So basically how to fill out that simple guide that I showed you. And then also um, sources of information and how to get community support for emergencies. So all three of these topics are covered virtually. They're covered in English and um, there's full interpretation in Spanish. And you do need to register for those at Sonoma County's library. Again, I'll put that link in the chat as well, but it's events at sonomacountylibrary.org if you have any questions about that. So I have one final thing I wanted to cover, and that is the really, really critical thing of getting together with your neighborhood to get prepared. Um, we know that emergencies will happen. We, um, if, if, you're not, if you're not certain of that, um, let me just tell you right now, they will happen. Uh, we, we have seen them happen once, twice, three, four times, a number of times in Sonoma County. And, there's, and it, it's unlikely that we won't have another emergency in the future. So the very best thing that we can suggest is that you can work with your neighbors to find out what type of resources you can share and to support each other as you look at emergencies. The people that you can see from your front door are likely to be your first responders in a major event like an earthquake, um, where you can't go anywhere and you can't do anything, but the people in your neighborhood are your support system and you are their support system. So um, we do have a website uh, at Sonoma County's um, SoCo Emergency, which is about neighborhood programs on our Get Ready page. I'll be also happy to put that in the chat. And you can look there at some of the different types of organizations. In Sonoma County, we have COPE groups, where, which are citizens organized to prepare for emergencies. We have map your neighborhood groups. We have fire safe groups. We have block captain groups. We have um, groups that don't go by any name, but it's just an informal group of neighbors who got together and said, I have a generator. Uh, I know first aid. Um, I can help you open your garage door. Um, you don't drive. Can I help you um, evacuate if we need to get out in a hurry? So people just getting together and offering and, and, and taking support where needed in order to get together and make this really work. So I will leave it there and let Misty take it away with talking about the Know Your Zone campaign. All right. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, and so if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And it looks like I'll be able to do that. All right. Is everybody able to see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm really covering um, three things. Um, I'll try to get through it quickly. I realize that our, our our night continues to, to uh, go on, but I wanna make sure that, you know, we take the time to go over things as thoroughly as needed so that we all have a good understanding of it. Um, so Nancy uh, mentioned know your zones. I'm gonna start out talking about evacuation zones. I'm gonna cover evacuation tags, and then also just real high level alerts. Essentially, how do you know when evacuation is happening? So starting out with your zone, um, Nancy mentioned in those evacuation packs, you've got a little, like a little magnet, a little spot where you can write your evacuation zone, which is really important because an evacuation zone is essentially a, a predetermined geographic area that the sheriff's office is going to use when we order evacuations, when we do evacuation orders and warnings. 
So that's our role in a disaster is evacuations. And this is a newer tool that we've um, rolled out to help you know very quickly and easily if you are in fact supposed to evacuate or not. So I'm gonna walk through the, the website with you here in just a moment, but it's very simple to find. The address is on your screen here. It's, it's hosted by the county at socoemergency.org slash evacuation hyphen map. So when you're on there, you're able to go right to Sonoma County, enter your address either on the text box or the map, and I'll show you both of those options. And number four is the most important part. Write down your evacuation zone number. You can put it in your evac pack. If you get that from Nancy, you can put it on your refrigerator. You can put it on your cell phone, your landline, um, whatever you do to remember your evacuation zone number, because that's what's going to, that's what we're going to use when we call those evacuation um, orders. And what we find is what we all know is when there's an evac, you hear about an evacuation order and you go like, oh my gosh, do I have to evacuate? Do I have to leave? What's going on? We, we tend to get a little bit panicky when we hear those things. So we, we want you to have as many tools as you can before, uh, before the disaster hits as inevitably will, um, so that you can be more prepared and more confident. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scoot over real quickly to the evacuation map. Um, and can everybody see my screen here? Still, um, now I'm on SoCo Emergency. Thanks for the head nods, friends. So when you, when you go onto the SoCo Emergency website, onto the evacuation map, you've got a couple of paragraphs about what an evacuation zone is. And there's two ways you can look up your zone. The first is with your text box here. So I'm gonna look up the zone for the Sheriff's Office substation out in the valley. Um, that's something that we all know. And it comes right up, it's at 810 Grove Street. And as soon as it pops up, you can see this is your evacuation zone. So this is what you want to write down. In this case, SON-6E1. That's how we're going to call those evacuation zones. That's the number that you want to write down. I'm also going to pull up the map very briefly so you can see what the map looks like. Um, it does take a couple minutes to load, but it's chock full of information. And during a disaster, it'll have more detailed information such as fire boundaries and heat maps things like that to give you um, some more situational awareness during an actual incident. The other nice thing about going to the map here is that you can look up um, your zone for, you know, your house, your kid's school, your work. You can look up zones for anybody really. And here you can see how all of the zones play together. So as you're hearing those evacuation zones being called, if you have kind of a general sense of the zones that are around you, um, it can be a little bit easier to understand how close the fire is and how you might be impacted. So if you choose to go to the map, you just go to the text box in the top left-hand corner and you enter your address. And it takes you right to your address and you can see right here, this is the Sheriff's Office substation and it's right here, at, oops, it's right there, SON-6E1. That's your evacuation zone. So those are the two ways that you can get there. Whatever works for you, go ahead and use it. I do recommend that if you're on your cell phone that you use that text tool. Um, the map is a little bit difficult to use on a mobile device because it just has so much good information on it. So that's my recommendation. Uh, let's get back here to the PowerPoint. So we covered evacuation zones fairly quickly. We're on to evacuation tags. Um, you might have seen evacuation tags. I know they've been advertised kind of all over the place. Kind of press did some coverage. All of our social media channels, um, neighborhood groups. Evacuation tags are um, a tool that we are deploying out to all of our people who live in Sonoma County, an unincorporated county, and the town of Windsor and city of Sonoma, because those are our contract cities. And um, this is a tag that you place in a highly visible location when you evacuate so that um, when first responders come through to evacuate, they can see right away that you're already gone. So what this does is it saves a lot of time. So as a deputy comes up to your house, he or she sees the evacuation tag um, on your gate or on your mailbox or on your front door, whatever is highly visible from the street. It's different on everybody's property. And that deputy knows right away, right away, great, I don't need to check the property, I can move on to the next. So it saves them the time of going up your driveway, knocking on your door, walking around the house, knocking on windows, making sure that you're okay and that you're gone because you've already left. And that deputy can focus on the next house. 
And so when people who are able to leave and able to self-evacuate use these tags, we can get through more quickly and we can focus our attention on people who might need more help, right? Um, there are some folks who, if you're elderly or disabled, um, it, it can be much more difficult to, to evacuate and we're here to help people get out of harm's way. So the bottom line is when we have faster evacuations, um, lives are saved. And that's what this is all about. This is that idea of a small, a small um, action having a large impact when done on a big scale. So here are examples of how you might place your evacuation tag. I, 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 I'm intentionally a little bit vague when I say highly visible location from the street. Again, because we all have different properties. And as you know, all throughout the county, all the properties look different. So these are just some examples of how this might work for you when you evacuate. And one of the questions that I get fairly often is, well, great, if I put out an evacuation tag, isn't that just gonna attract looters? Isn't that just gonna tell them I, that I'm gone? Well, yes, and so will a lot of other things. You know, when we're under an evacuation zone, I'm, or I'm sorry, when you're under evacuation order, that's an order from the sheriff, um, and it's a misdemeanor to violate that order. So the assumption is that when there's an evacuation zone under evacuation order, everybody should be gone. So any, potential thieves, potential people who wanna cause harm are gonna hear about that through all of the social media, any emergency alerts that they might get, it's all over the media. And then we're also marking homes. When we have time as we're evacuating homes, we mark homes with yellow tape. And that's a visual indicator for the hundreds of peace officers who come through that yes, this house has already been notified of an evacuation. So there are a lot of different ways that everybody knows that places are evacuated, including unfortunately people who might wanna cause harm while you're gone, which is why we take security so seriously. Our first priority is getting you out of harm's way. Your life is our most important priority. Once you're safe, then we take that responsibility very seriously to protect your property. That's our second priority. So what do we do to keep your home and your property safe while you're gone? We have roadblocks and those are typically manned by, staffed by peace officers, both from the sheriff's office and potentially from one of our, you know, dozens of mutual aid agencies that come to our rescue every fire, it seems. We have deputies patrolling evacuation zones. So they're actively driving around and looking for people who shouldn't be there. Um, and we historically have not had a big problem with looting. So, We've had about a dozen arrests per fire over the last several fires for the penal code section that is called unauthorized entry in an evacuation zone. So it's different than looting because looting is essentially theft in an evacuation zone. So what we're trying to do is we are catching people before it's a problem. So we've had about a dozen arrests or so. And of those arrests per fire, there's like, you know, one or two who get charged with looter, looting. So we're, we're typically catching people before they have a chance to break in or do potentially do harm um, because we're actively out there patrolling and holding those boundaries the best that we can. So I want to address that because it's, it's hard to leave your home. Um, I've been evacuated twice. There's nothing fun about it. And it's really difficult to not be there and not know what's going on. So this I find is sometimes helpful to talk about who has eyes on your property when you can't be there. So if you wanna get your evacuation tag, if you don't already have it, you can stop by any of our offices. I think the closest office to you guys generally would be the Valley Substation or Sonoma Police Department. If you've got an organized neighborhood group that you want to, and you wanna to distribute to your neighbors, your network, whatnot, you're welcome to send an email to the email address on the screen there, sheriff-outreach at sonoma-county.org and you can request a package of tags and we will either deliver that to you or get it ready for you for pickup so you can distribute it to, to your network. And we've had a lot of success with that. We've had a lot of grassroots effort of neighbors taking care of neighbors before something happens. So it's been um, really wonderful to see actually. So you know your zone already, you've written it down, you've gotten your evacuation tag, so you're ready to roll. How do you find out about an evacuation occurring? Um, there's a lot of different ways that the sheriff's office lets you know about an evacuation and Department of Emergency Management. So uh, Department of Emergency Management with the county actually owns the alert and warning program. They're the ones who are responsible for that program. 
but we work very closely with them and we, you know, we supplement their efforts because we know that it takes a whole team of us to keep everybody safe. So on your screen here, you've got a list of all the different ways that you might hear about an evacuation. And the first five um, ways that are in that green box are official ways that the sheriff's office or the county will notify you. So you've got um, the high-low siren, which I'm gonna play for you right now, is on all of our patrol vehicles and it's also on fire, uh, fire vehicles as well. So I'm gonna play this for you right now so you can hear that high-low siren because it's very, very different than our normal siren. So when you hear that siren, when you hear the high low, it's time to go. That means that there's an evacuation in place. That's one of the tools that we might use. You may have a deputy knocking on your door, letting you know that the evacuation is happening. You may hear PA announcements from a deputy's patrol car, letting you know that an evacuation is happening. Um, you may be getting alerts, and I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on the next page about what those options are, but that's like a SoCo alert or a Nixel. And you may see something on social media. I, um, I have a star on my presentation because social media can be very helpful and very detrimental depending on the source. So the sheriff's office uses social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, it's not an alerting tool because we're not pushing it to you. It's one, but we copy all of our evacuation orders and warnings on our social media accounts just to give people more situational awareness and get that information out there faster. So when you are on social media, just be aware of the page that you're looking at and be aware of the source that you're looking at because not everything we see on social media is true, as you guys probably know. Uh, you may hear about evacuations through the media, um, through radio and TV and local papers. Um, and as Nancy mentioned earlier, she talked about neighbors helping neighbors. You may hear about it from your neighbor. You may have somebody checking on you to make sure that you've heard about it and see if you need any help. So there's a lot of different ways that you might hear about an evacuation. And it's really a good thing because there is no perfect system. There's no one magic answer to notify every one of you know, the 500,000 people who live in the county of when an evacuation is happening. So that's why it's important to have multiple systems and have those redundancies built in so that you're not um, left in the dark if something happens. So I'm just gonna touch kind of on alert systems on a very high level. The column on the left are the alert systems that you have to subscribe to. And the column on the right are these forced alerts or these systems you don't have to subscribe to that you might hear about. Um, again, the, the bright green box are the systems that the sheriff's office uses. The other systems listed are what our partners at emergency management use. So it's really, really important to sign up for both SoCo Alert and Nixle. Um, both of those are two different, two different ways to alert you. And as I mentioned before, redundancy is really key. You don't want to not know what's happening. And frankly, maybe I'm just nerdy because this is what I do all day, but I would rather get two alerts than none. So I, I'd rather have too much information than not enough. Um, so sign up for SoCo Alert, sign up for Nixel. You may get, you may see or hear one of these forced alerts that our partners put out. So the first one is called a wireless emergency alert. And that is like, uh, it's like an Amber Alert on your cell phone and it comes through and it makes a really irritating noise to get your attention. So you may get that. You may see the emergency alert system in place um, on the TV or over the radio where you see on the TV an emergency message scrolling across or you hear that message coming across the radio. Uh, you may, uh, if you have a landline, you may get a phone call um, from what is essentially called reverse 911. There are some limitations with the system given, you know, we used to have old copper lines and now we have the new VoIP lines and, um, you know, it doesn't work as, it doesn't always work on the VoIP lines, but it is one option that we do have. Um, and then you may also, uh, sorry, you know what, I, I moved my, uh, my panel there, I can't read my last bullet. You may hear um, it on the weather radio. If you have a weather radio, if you have a NOAA weather radio, um, again, our partners will may use that to send out a notification via that weather radio that there is an evacuation order in place. So there's lots of different ways that you might find out about an evacuation. And so it's just good to have a familiarity with what those systems are and what those, those tools are so that um, you sort of know what you're hearing and reading when it comes up. 
that's where I'm going to end it. So I appreciate you guys, you know, giving us the time to talk tonight, both Nancy and myself. If you have any further evacuation questions, you can go to our website there um, on our evacuation page. You can follow us on our social media accounts and I will turn it back to the vice chair and I'm available for any questions if you have any. Well, I thank you both very much. And uh, first of all, Nancy, I attended a couple of months ago, the psychology of disaster preparedness uh, presentation that you did and it was just excellent. And uh, so thank you very much for that. Also, thank you for, so much. Misty, do you have any recommendations for us in the Glen Ellen Kenwood corridor along Highway 12 in regards to evacuation? Will the evacuation number that pertains to our neighborhood be defined enough or would it be so general? For, let me give you an example. In Oakmont, would there be multiple evacuation zones or one? So um, I'm not as familiar with Oakmont because that's city of Santa Rosa, not okay. county. So I, I'm not dialed in a, a, as well. Um, if you want, I'm happy to pull up the evacuation map uh, for about uh, through the Glenwood, Glen Ellen area to give you a little bit of a sense of it. Yeah, do either Glen Ellen or Kenwood. And, and, and I'm just curious about sure. how specific it will become. Uh, yeah. Damon, this is Susan Gorin. Oakmont is broken down into three or four evacuation zones. And then there okay. are different zones across Highway 12 from Oakmont. Thank you. It makes sense that there would be, so you wouldn't necessarily have everybody leaving at once, but that's, who knows? Exactly. So what, you know, what we try to do is make sure that the zones are, um, you know, have logical boundaries as we're evacuating people with respect to roads and likely evacuation routes. Um, but they're also small enough that it's, um, we're evacuating a reasonable number of people and we're not over evacuating. So it's kind of a balance um, as we go throughout the county. Um, you can see Glen Ellen is right here. So Glen Ellen has, this is Sonoma Valley Regional Park. This is Glen Ellen listed here. Um, I'm looking for, Highway 12, since that's the usual marker that I use. So here's Highway 12 right around here. So it's generally this line where my cursor is. Yes. So you can see that to the left of, you can see several different evacuation zones. So 6A4, 6B3, 6A3 is over here, uh, 6A5, 6C3, 6C2. So when we make the announcements or when you click on it, you'll see zone 6C2 is, is Glen Ellen, Glen Ellen and Jack London State Park. So when we're making these announcements, we try to have a general idea for people in addition to the zone number to try to give you some context. So your zone number is what you really want to look up and pay attention to, but we're, we're going to try to do those announcements and we provide the general location to give you some context when you hear it because 6C2 doesn't mean anything to anybody. Um, so we're trying to make sure that it's as logical and orderly as possible, but giving you a little bit of that context too, as far as the, where it's actually located. One of the questions that always comes up in evacuation, especially I live in Kenwood, the village, mm -hmm. which way to go? And mm -hmm. so I found that the alert to leave was very good. The information on which way to go was kind of up to me. Yeah. And, and sometimes I find that I make the wrong choice. I decided I want to go to Santa Rosa and it's blocked with yeah. that bumper to bumper traffic. So then you turn around and go another direction, maybe out Warm Springs, maybe down Highway 12. Mm -hmm. Will there be some way to tell you which way to go? If we know, we'll tell you. So that's the okay. short answer. I, <laughs> I, I hear your frustration on that, um, particularly the glass fire. What we saw is we, as we were evacuating people off the hill, that traffic eastbound into Highway 12 blocked up. So we were intentionally issuing those evacuation notices as early as possible to get people out of the way. Um, but you're in a, in a situation where you're trying to send too many people down a road that's too small to handle that capacity, right? So if we have enough situational awareness and we know which way to send you, we will include that in the alert. It's very difficult in the first, I'm gonna say 12 to 24 hours of a major fire incident. It's challenging to figure out exactly what's going on. 
Um, you know, you, you see where the fire is, you're getting people all the way, but you don't really have a handle on what kind of animal this is quite yet. Um, there, there's two kind of pieces of advice that I can give you if we can't tell you which direction to go. The first piece of advice that I have is identify where the threat is and move away. So when you go outside and if you can see flames or you know feel the smoke in which direction the wind is blowing, go in the opposite direction so you're not going into the fire. Um, the second piece of advice that I have is um, observing as you get to, you know, say up to Highway 12, once you know where your threat is and, and which general direction you have to move, look at the traffic both ways. And if you can go somewhere that's opposite of where the traffic is backing up, take that route and it might take you the long way around to where you need to be, but you're not going to be stuck in traffic for a couple of hours. Um, I wish I had some some foolproof solution for this one, but it is just the nature of emergencies. Thank you, Misty, for explaining the how the zones are broken up into different pieces and, and how you've tried to come up. I think it's a great idea. Uh, and so I am going to try to learn what Kenwood, what my Kenwood zone is, because I don't know. I'll find Excellent. out, I'll find <laughs> out. Are there any other questions from council members um, for our fine friends here today? Uh, Angela Nardo Morgan. Okay, thank you, Damon. Um, so, um, you know, many of us, I believe, all of us have heard so many presentations on emergency preparedness. And I want to really just give a shout out to both Misty and Nancy because this was so well done and just immensely, immensely useful. So, thank you so much. Um, I do have a question. Um, I live in the Warm Springs Glen Ellen neighborhood near Arnold Drive. Of course, we've been evacuated many times. I am now a neighborhood block captain. We created a, a neighborhood group. Um, and my first question is for Nancy. I would love to get some evac packs and do, would you just, do I just uh, email you and how do I do that? And then my second question, it's a little wacky, but it's for Misty. Um, for some reason, we all decided, uh, or the block captains decided, well, what if we just can't get a hold of somebody? What if they don't answer the phone? What if they don't hear us yelling across the street? So we, <laughs> we decided the captains all got air horns and we're gonna set off the air horns. Is this in any way contraindicated with your high-low siren? I mean, is it something we should or shouldn't do? We didn't really think it through, but... Um, just wanted to find out if that's a good idea or not. I love the wacky questions. Thank you. Thank you for bringing it on. Um, there, there's no, there's no problem from the sheriff's office perspective of using air horns. There's nothing that would give some sort of alternate signal. I think the most important thing with the air horns is that everybody in the neighborhood knows what they mean. So that way, when you use them, everybody's aware of the significance of it. Um, I think it's great, honestly, that you guys are creating a communication system that works for you. I think it's fantastic. Um, and it won't cause any issues for the deputies. So you're good to go. Okay, we've actually had practice sessions with the air horns, so we know. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And thank you so much for being a block captain. I think that's awesome. Um, so all you really need to do, I did put my email in the chat. Um, if you email me and I'm nancy.a.brown at sonoma-county.org, there is a Nancy Brown in probation. She will not give you evac, evac packs, so be sure to put the <laughs> A in there. Um, and um, just email me and let me know how many you need and we can arrange a time to uh, meet somewhere and make that exchange. Um, I will be out of town until Tuesday. So I probably won't answer your email until then, but um, I will get it. And as soon as I get back on Tuesday, we'll um, put heads together and anybody listening that has a similar need, just email me and let me know about how many you need. Again, they're available in English as well as in Spanish. So let me know if you need 30 in English and 10 in Spanish or whatever that looks like. And we'll make sure to get together and get those handed off to you. Thank you so much. Any other council members with questions? Hannah, can we go to our public comment to see if there's any hands up there? Absolutely. And um, Misty, if you don't mind, stop sharing your screen. That'd be great. Thank you. And so looking over here, if anyone wants to make public comment, go ahead and raise your hand in the Zoom app. Or if you're joining by phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand. And it looks like we have one hand raised. So just one moment, I'll share my screen.
And our first commenter, you should now be able to unmute and you'll have two minutes. Um, hi, this is Larry Davis again. Uh, the experience we had back in 2017 has sort of seared a lot of folks here up on Sonoma Mountain so that we know that what we want to be able to do is have a volunteer force up here that can handle things because we're not a high priority and the trucks can't get in because the roads are too narrow. And had we not had people that did not evacuate and stayed here voluntarily with trucks and barrels of water, our own home would have been burned down. So I'm wondering if we have some way to uh, bring the volunteers at the neighborhood level in conjunction, sort of a deputy volunteer force that can not evacuate intentionally and can help others to evacuate knowing that they're going to be have to handle what we experienced, which was a forest fire coming from the air where the embers were dropping. And unless these people had gone around and shut those down as they dropped, the mountain would have gone then. Now we don't know what's gonna happen in the future and it may not happen here, but the, the way the winds and the, and the fires work on the mountains, we really need more people up here and we can't really rely on drawing forces out from you know the other fire districts and so forth because they're already overwhelmed. So I'm wondering if there's some way that that uh, I don't know with what we're trying to put together up here how we how we can do that without bumping into some problem of officialdom because you know these are competent retired farmer firemen people up here. But I want to know how we how we can organize that. How do we relate to you without, you know, feel, feeling like vigilantes? All right, thank you. And um, Vice Chair Das, I see no additional hands uh, raised at this time. Thank you, Larry, for your question. And uh, I don't know if there's an answer that our guests have or not, but uh, we'll offer that up to them. Yeah, I can, Vice Chair, I can, I can respond. Um, Larry, my, my first recommendation to you would be to talk to your local fire department or your local fire agency to talk about the logistics of that to see if that's something that they're willing to consider. And secondarily, we can talk um, talk with the sheriff's office side of things because it's it's opening up a whole can of worms. I I understand where you're coming from about wanting to protect your home and especially what you experienced in 2017. Um, so this, what we're talking about is kind of a crossover of fire operations and the evacuation side of it. So that's why I recommend first talking to the fire folks to see if that's a possibility, and then they can get in touch with us and we can see if that's a possibility from the the law side. Thank you for bringing it up. Are there any other questions uh, then from the uh, public? I guess not. Well, again, thank you both. Excellent, excellent presentation. And uh, let's get prepared. Let's get ready. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. Item number seven on our agenda, North Sonoma Valley Max support for projects. And you did receive, I do believe, a North Sonoma Valley MAC draft motion to support emergency preparedness ad hoc committee actions. And so this is a resolution item, an action item. It's our only action item for tonight. Essentially, it is a format for uh, endorsing. Uh, our challenge was how do we come up with an endorsement from the MAC that's specific enough to me be meaningful and yet timely enough so that if we have an, an opportunity for some grant funds or to partner with somebody, because we don't do grant funds, right, Anna? Right, Ariel? Um, that we were gonna partner with somebody that we would have a document uh, that would be quick to use. And that is a challenge for uh, public agencies all the time. So this was an attempt uh, by Mark Newhauser, our chair, of the emergency preparedness group uh, to address this issue. And I think it's been run by Ariel and, and Hannah. And is there any other comment from anybody in regards to uh, this proposed process? 
in this document, there's, I believe, enough specificity to tell us what we're trying to do, what we want to do, and how we're going to do it. Uh, but uh, maybe not a lot of details in uh, some of the math that might be uh, helpful in some grant applications. Ariel or, or Hannah, was there anything else that you wanted to add in regards to uh, this resolution and your conversations with Mark? Yeah, um, I will just add that, you know, we. I think he left town before I could get a, an answer, but there was a, a grant that um, that group had applied for where Supervisor Gordon had submitted a letter of support. And I was asking him if we could bring that letter forward um, if, for example, they don't get that grant and they want to reapply for it another time. Um, uh, I didn't get a concrete answer on that, but I think, um, yeah, I think this is just a general kind of a, a resolution to support the work. Um, and I think if there was any kind of letter or request from the preparedness committee um, for a letter that kind of deviated from this, this that would need to come back before the, the MAC, right? Um, yeah, that's, that's my comments on that. A challenge with these letters of support from a public agency is to be timely, no question about it, and also to be specific enough so that it's not so general that it has no meaning at all. And or it's, it's so general that you can't really tell uh, what exactly they are supporting. I think this particular letter does give an indication of what we're trying to do and what we hope to do and that the outcome. And so, um, as a member of the Emergency Preparedness Committee, um, when asked for, for consideration in regards to this particular action. Any other questions from any uh, council members or comments? Uh, yes, Council Member Eagles. Thank you. So I don't know what best procedure is here. I know, I think we're gonna, we're gonna vote on this at some point, right? So we'll need a motion. So we could discuss after motion is made, but, but just to, to clarify this, because I'm, I'm, I'm reading it, but it, in the fourth bullet point down, it, it, it talks about the project creating two community wildfire protection plans. That is referring to someone else's projects, right? Uh, I, I just want to make sure I understand the scope of this and, and right. the intention behind it. And I, I think it's all general so we can act as needed within the scope of this document. But that's the one thing I was a little unsure about. Who, who's, who's, um, who's are those? Who's are those plans? It, exactly. That is, I believe, as I understand it myself, is part of the CAL FIRE, CAL FIRE application. We would not, we the MAC would not be the implementer. Uh, we would be a partner in support of, but not necessarily the holder of the grant or the dollars that would come from uh, Cal Fire in regards to this project. Is that correct as far as you know, Ariel or Anna, or maybe supervisor knows? Yeah, I mean, so this, uh, I'll just say that a community wildfire protection plan is a huge undertaking. So it's certainly not something that could be done solely by this preparedness um, ad hoc, right? So um, it's a much bigger project. And I think that it is, there's a number of different, the fire districts are involved in Sonoma Ecology Center. So it's sort of a community wide um, effort, should they get the grant, um, that would bring in a lot of stakeholders. And, and the, I think it was kind of started by the work of the preparedness ad hoc, but they certainly don't own it. Um, I think they were the spark. Okay. Is a way to think about it. And then the area that I know more about uh, is the two community efforts. Uh, we have selected a specific community, both in Kenwood and in Glen Ellen, that we would try to work the um, map your neighborhood and some of the products that were presented tonight uh, by Nancy Brown uh, would be included uh, so that we would work with these communities and to see how easy, how well would that really work and what would be our role as education and as conveners and, uh, and bringing people together rather than running. Again, we were not the implementers of these programs. We are sort of the uh, conveners of these programs. Any other questions in regards to uh, 
Well, uh, we can have a further discussion after the, if, if there is a motion uh, to approve uh, this resolution, uh, the chair would entertain. Hearing none, seeing none, uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll let this one pass it at this point. Uh, I see uh, no motion to approve. Okay. And next we go to our reports. And our first report is uh, some of the SVCAC. And uh, Matthew's not here, but uh, I think Ariel was going to give a report. I, I can, but I think there wasn't there a second. I'm trying to pull up the agenda. Wasn't there a se second item under that? Yeah. The other letter. Yes. There is. Oh, and I'm I, so I just. I, I don't want to belabor this, um, Vice Chair Doss, uh, but are, were we finished with your topic? I, I suppose we were because people are not quite prepared to, to address it. I, 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 I felt like I was almost prepared. To, I, I want to give you guys license to pursue your good work. I, I just don't, and I, but I, and I don't want to reopen this agenda item if it's closed, you know, if that's, so, if that's since good. Since we didn't but, get to the second part of it, it's not closed. So we're, no, it's not. It's my, uh, my, my, Problem there. Okay, so, so let's so go to the let's yeah. go to the second part of the of the uh, proposal, which is the London Ranch Road Arnold Drive crosswalk improvements, traffic and safety ad hoc. Oh, okay. Well, I think that's me, right? Uh, yes. That's the, the traffic and safety ad hoc group, and that was uh, yeah, yeah. I will speak to that. So. Uh, let's see, just a little context here. I think our, our group, our ad hoc, wants to encourage, you know, appropriate and thorough follow-up um, within our max scope of any issues that are brought to our attention in terms of traffic and safety. And I was pleased to hear Supervisor Gorin address Katie Chris's comment of earlier of that intersection because that was something that I hoped was in it was brought to attention. And you've already confirmed that ha that has been or will be brought to attention. So what we wanted to talk about today is that that actually Chair Dawson brought up that despite the great work on rep repainting the crosswalk uh, at the corner of London Ranch Road and Arnold Drive, it's that broad, inter broad crosswalk in the middle of Glen Ellen, um, there's still some potential additional um, improvements that could be made there. And he told an anecdotal story of stepping off into the crosswalk of the newly painted and a police car cut him off because it didn't perceive, didn't see, didn't notice. I don't think it was intentional. But so we, so the suggestion is for this group, um, is it okay for the traffic and safety ad hoc to basically develop a letter um, with some potential additional suggested improvements or possible suggested improvements, which might include um, moving some signage around. Maybe it would, to be clearer, uh, maybe it would include a suggested rumble strip or some other kind of interrupting sort of uh, device to get people to pay attention because there was a request to, to sort of thank the Public Works Department for the work that they had done in repainting this, but to see if we could take it to its logical conclusion to do a little more work on this intersection to see if we can improve it. Um, I, um, I think that's about it. So we don't have the letter for you to approve and to look at um, uh, today or now, um, but, but, but wanted to, to sort of ask for uh, a general sense from the MAC here today, whether that we could go ahead and, and draft that letter for your approval, let's say for the July meeting. I, th I think that sort of sums it up. Um, if my fellow members of the ad hoc have other comments or, or certainly Ariella Hanna, please weigh in. Uh, yes. Uh, well, this is Jed Cooper. Hello. Go ahead, Jed, and then we'll go back to Angela. Go, go ahead, Jed. Yeah, I just want to add, uh, first of all, appreciate Kate's kind of leadership on this. I, that uh, Just add that that intersection is such a busy one and so many angles that I think our, our natural, I think our greatest wish would be to have a light flashing there. And I guess we can include that in the letter, but um, I just want to add that. Seems like a logical kind of thing, an important element uh, to focus on. That's all. Thank you, council member. And I'm gonna to get to you, Susan Gordon, in a second, but I'm gonna do Angela Nardo Morgan first, if I could. And again, I wanna uh, concur with Jed. Thank you so much, Kate, for spearheading this. Um, 
And I want to apologize to both Kate and Jed because we did meet and we did talk a great deal about all of these ideas. And I actually ran into my friend Nick Brown yesterday and I was not able to give Jed and Kate this information, but um, the forum, as you know, he's, he's the, he's the uh, coordinator for the Glen Ellen Forum and was on the traffic and safety committee that looked at this crosswalk and informed me that indeed the county, they, they actually went to the county engineers uh, back when, before, before COVID, uh, before the fires and um, talked And the county engineer, the head engineers told Nick Brown that they're actually looking at this crosswalk and they want to re-engineer it. And they had a plan to actually, it's really cattywampus if you know this crosswalk. Uh, and they, they're looking at re-engineering. I think the, that original county engineer left, but the assistant is still there. So I wanna propose to Jed and Kate that maybe in addition to the letter, we should contact and, and if we can, I don't know if we're allowed to, I don't know how this all works yet, but contact those engineers or that engineer and you know, find out about this plan. That is supposedly in, their, in the works. Supervisor Gordon. Yeah, sure, I'd be, I'd be in favor of that, yes. Um, Angela, Kate, thank you so much for your work on this. Um, when it comes to something like this, uh, improvements of the road, I would hope and encourage you to work through uh, our office to make sure that we're in the loop on this. Wow. Uh, I have known for a while that at some point we need to uh, perhaps procure a grant to look at pedestrian and bicycle safety throughout the village of Glen Ellen in anticipation of the redevelopment of the Sonoma Developmental Center. And so I think it's time now that we really reach out to uh, Johannes and the county to explore potential grant funding for a consultant to look at this, uh, not just making assumptions about what we think would work in the intersection. And we absolutely want to make sure that we collectively are in the loop for any discussions by a traffic engineer, uh, because we, it needs to work for the county, it needs to work for the MAC, and it needs to work for our office. So there, there's enough going on at this intersection and throughout the village that I think it's time to put some um, heft into thinking about this a little bit more thoughtfully. Great, great. Yeah. And, and to be clear, I think the, the thought was just a letter might suggest some possible options to keep it on the on the burner. But I think um, better ideas. And, and I want to encourage you to go ahead and think. <laughs> send <laughs> yeah. the letter of thank you to the county, um, but um, suggest that uh, per the suggestion of Supervisor Gorin, let's work together to talk about a potential um, community conversations about traffic, at, uh, traffic, pedestrian, and bicycle safety through the corridor. Okay, so I think what we're hearing, and we can take it back to the ad hoc if this is what I'm hearing, is that maybe this letter has sort of a broader, a broader scope now. Um, and, and it, it would start um, that conversation. It's not going to be fast. It's not going to be easy and you have to have funding for it. But I knew that at some point we would need to have this conversation and I will initiate uh, potentially a meeting with Johannes and maybe you, Kate, uh, and maybe someone from the forum to start thinking about how we might uh, consider this. What's the pleasure of the council given consideration to all the things that we've heard in the last few minutes? Shall we wait for a letter or another meeting of the committee to bring back some more information or how, how would you like to handle this? We don't actually have a letter to vote on. And that's, uh, and sounds like there is more information that could be or different information that might be added to a letter in the near future. Sorry, is this addressed to, to me? Sounds ad like our, our ad yeah. hoc. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, Jed, please continue. No, it's just, it's, it just sounds like our ad hoc needs to go back and 
gather more detail from other sources that would, would go into a letter for approval. Approval Is that right? How would a supervisor go in to kind of direct us there? I think we don't, aren't clear. Well, what we might do is to just, um, um, Ariel and Hannah might help us set up a meeting with Johannes to talk about this. And then we can report back at the next MAC meeting about um, what we're discussing and potential routes forward. That's before the letter then? So we would wait till after that to Well, you uh, could put go together. ahead and send a letter. You could go ahead and send a letter of thank you, but um, <clears throat> we're going to be working on a parallel path. And that's okay with you? Sure. Okay. Okay, well, let's noodle this around at the ad hoc. And if it, if, it, if it adds to the party, I think a letter for next meeting would be good. But if it doesn't add much, and this is we have two parallel paths here, and we're not supporting the path, we're not supporting the parallel paths by this letter, maybe we table it. So we can take it back and, and, and talk that through, I think. Sure, sure. Great. Thank you, Susan, <laughs> for the clarity. Later on in our agenda, we're going to talk about future future items for discussion, and I think perhaps we need more understanding about what is needed for a recommendation from the MAC in regards to a project, uh, and exactly what is the criteria that we need to have. And because I'm unclear now, having um, seen no movement on the first one and a little bit of uncertainty on the second item in this category um, that we probably either need a better understanding of how to bring it to the MAC or how we, I'm just not sure. Ariel, do you have any comment? I see you popped up there, so maybe you have a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to let you all know um, when we did the budget request forms and I had my presentation I was gonna go through and then we tabled the presentation. So one of the, and I might've mentioned this at that meeting, one of my suggestions in that presentation is to work with the outreach committee, which would be led by the outreach committee, right? Because um, you are all on the Mac, not I. Um, I am here and Hannah is here for support, but to kind of come up with a policy for letters of support and other things like that. And then perhaps we could move to a place where they would work sort of like the board's consent calendar unless something needed more discussion but we do need sort of some rules and parameters about what the MAC, so, so it'd be the drafting of a policy and bringing the policy back before the MAC for approval. Um, and then everyone would be on the same page with that. So um, I'm, just, I'm just throwing that out there. Um, okay, um, council member Handrum. Yeah, can I just ask for a little clarity on, on that? How do we know, um, in developing a policy, how do we know what our parameters are? Like, <laughs> um, is it does the entire you know how, does the entire MAC need to hear hear the entire um, letter before it can go out? Is it um, is it okay if we email everybody? I mean, how do we know um, what kind of framework we work within to develop that policy? I think it would start, and we can have a meeting about that. Um, you know, we can we can have a more in depth conversation, right? That's why I'm suggesting it come out of an ad hoc because the ad hoc can meet. So um, I'm happy to have a conversation and, and Hannah as well. It would come through the bylaws, right? It would be kind of digging into the bylaws and seeing what your purview is, and the the sorts of um, limitations and possibilities created by the Brown Act, essentially. So. Um, it would obviously only be things that were in your purview, um, but I do, and, and maybe the MAC might decide that something like um, uh, Mark uh, Neuhauser's resolution, they would all feel comfortable with, um, you know, that the preparedness ad hoc taking that resolution that was approved, running with it, drafting a letter and putting the MAC's name on it, maybe they would decide that that was fine. Um, but I just want to make sure that everyone can understand or if they want to see the letter first. But, but approval of letters does have to happen at the public meetings. We can't have kind of e-votes, which is sort of what uh, Vice Chair Doss was talking about 
um, you know, the challenges with having a, a letter approved at a public meeting. You always can call a special meeting if there's a deadline happening, but um, yeah. I think it, it deserves a, a deeper dive kind of discussion to craft the policy. And I think the appropriate place would be the outreach committee. But if you all decide you want to make a new ad hoc or just have two people volunteer, that's also fine. Um, I think part of the confusion for me, and, and, I'll, and I think I can speak for the rest of the emergency preparedness, as the ad hoc, we went about putting together a series of uh, programs and, and projects and understood as we went along that we could not implement, we could not own, but we could foster, we could partner with, we could do certain things. And I think our, our chair of our ad hoc, Mark Neuhauser, wrote this resolution, if you want to call it a resolution, as a, uh, here's what we're doing, what do you think? Do you support what we're doing? Is this, are you supportive of these ideas? And, and I think that's what he thought and we thought we were supposed to do. And, and, and being he's not here, so I don't have his exact words, but I think that is, there is confusion because the Traffic Safety Committee also went out and did their work and found us an, uh, something they wanted to have a project on. And so I think that it's, it's a, a lack of understanding of, of our process as Council Member Handred brought up. So uh, maybe, maybe in our upcoming meeting, one of our upcoming meetings, we need to actually hear that presentation from you, Ariel, that we didn't have time for <laughs> the other day, because there clearly were nuggets of information in there that we didn't have. Well, I think I, I, I always felt like when you formed the preparedness ad hoc, and when then Mark Neuhauser gave his report that outlined their projects, which are sort of the same as what's in the resolution and the MAC did like support that. I mean, I always understood that the MAC had by forming the ad hoc and by, you know, supporting it informally that that is formal support. It's more about the letter with the logo that's signed by, it's more about the letter itself. It's not, I, my understanding of the conversations I've had with Mark is that he wanted a formal letter. When you're talking about a formal letter that you could put in a grant application, um, if I were on a body, I would want to review that letter and perhaps suggest changes before my name was put on it. But that doesn't mean that I don't support the project of that they are applying for the grant. It, does that make sense? Yeah, so so that's, how, that's how I've kind of been understanding this confusion. I guess, um, not, not about that the MAC doesn't support the work of the emergency preparedness ad hoc, that it's more about the specific, the letter itself. Right. And, and I think that's what he thought he had created. And, and, and clearly, uh, by lack of action, uh, that wasn't what was understood uh, by the council tonight. So uh, we'll bring it back or we'll, we'll have a further conversation. Council Member Eagles. Yeah, and I do again. I, when I when I opened up the agenda earlier, or asked for it to be open. It wasn't so much the London Ranch Road. It was it was it was this preparedness item. I feel like we hadn't quite discussed because I realized when you asked for a motion that I didn't really know what we were moving to do. So the general bullet points on this, I don't know that anyone was was struggling with. Uh, there were some specifics in here on the fourth bullet that I think were a little harder to get head around in terms of the general parameters of this but but to Ariel's point I, I, I felt that uh, that yeah you guys are doing great work and we support this so I think it was a little bit of a for me a little bit of a question what's the what's the actual ask here there's no letter there's no specific is it the the grant proposal anyway so um, I just wanted to be clear on that because I think I do in general support this document it just has some complexity in here that I wasn't sure what to do with um, so I understand I, I, yeah um, yeah I got you yeah Council Member Morgan, Narder uh, Morgan. I, um, yeah, I, I agree with Kate on that. I was kind of confused on exactly what the ask was. And for Ariel, I think that um, it's just growing pains. And I think as time goes on, we're going to figure this all out really, really well. Um, but I have a question about outreach. And I know Vicki's on that group and Arthur, and I know Melissa left. But uh, it, it seems like we continually have very small numbers of our community. And I know we're new, but I was wondering if um, 
I know that the Glen Ellen Forum, uh, every time they have their monthly meetings and they send out um, they send out the agenda and they send out a reminder and a link to a, a whole cadre of people. Uh, and what I was wondering is, could we do something similar? Could we maybe use their list? Because I know myself, I'm really busy. I sometimes just forget, when is that meeting? Uh, you know, was it the middle of the week, month or the end of the month? So, I, I mean, is there a way that we could actually send out yeah, some sort of email with a link to let the community know when these are happening. I know it's in the paper. Um, I just would love to see more people, you know, this is the community voice. I would love to see more people connected to it. I don't know, it's just an, an idea. I don't really know what the answer is, but a suggestion. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think that, that um, it's it's probably absolutely something that can be done. It's a matter of getting the the hearing from the people who want to receive the information and getting their contact information. Um, and so uh, we can do some thinking about what the best way to go about that would be. Yeah, it's a great list and it's a comprehensive list. And maybe Kenwood and maybe Eldridge has something similar. I don't know that we could link into possibly. I'll just add that we do, um, you know, and, and Hannah will inherit it, but there is a spreadsheet that has all the MAC members in our minute taker and, you know, the supervisor born staff. And then I have a second sheet that I call the FYI list um, that I send the materials out to, not the internal discussions that we have, but the agenda, all of those things. Um, and that has uh, some folks from tourism who had expressed an interest when we were first forming. Um, the Kenwood Press, the Index Tribune, um, some other media folks, and then a couple smattering of people who had reached out to Supervisor Warden's office and asked to be added to the list. So um, we already sort of do have that for the official. Um, mm -hmm. So if, if someone wanted to get the consent of others to be added to this list, we are happy to add them. Any more discussion in regards to item number seven? Any comments from the public? And it looks like we do have one hand raised. And then if anyone else from the public would like to speak, you can raise your hand in the Zoom app or press star nine on your phone. So one minute, I'll share my screen. All right, in our first commenter, you should now be able to unmute. Hi, this is your friend Larry acting as the public talking to you. <laughs> uh, I think that the distinction between policy and, this, and doing an actual program is pretty serious because if you're talking about changing up a policy of what you're going to be involved in, for instance, if you're going to be involved in traffic around bicycles, you're going to be involved in planning, and you might as well take the whole thing and start getting involved in a specific plan of Glen Ellen to complement the specific plan of the Sonoma Development Center, because otherwise you're going to have one specific plan of the Sonoma Development Center, and you're going to be in the sphere of influence of that plan with no plan of your own. So it's really important to me that you take all of these bits and pieces and start interrelating them into the idea that we had last year of let's have a specific plan for Glen Ellen, have Glen Ellen be the center of things and have the SDC be in our sphere of influence, which it always has been and hopefully always would be. So there's a difference here of a focus and I'm saying the policy has to be with you to decide to go ahead and make that policy. With regard to Mark's proposal, it's a proposal, it's a grant proposal, and I'm not quite sure how that fits with an agency of the government asking for to support a grant proposal, which the government is then involved in giving the grant. Uh, <laughs> I just don't, don't know about those dynamics. So I think it needs looking into, and I for one wanna see the actual grant and what's being proposed to do before I support something like that because a letter that's very vague does not tell me what's actually gonna happen. And I've been hearing a lot of stuff out there about how people are organizing neighborhoods because of all this money falling from the sky 
to organize neighborhoods. And how many, how many organizers are we gonna have in Glen Ellen doing the same thing with the same data from the same CAL FIRE and so forth? I, it's, it's a little turbulent to me. So I'd like clarification of that before I as a public member would like you to spend whatever energy time you have doing that. And so uh, the other question I think is, it's not a matter of a letter, it's a matter of a decision to take a position with regard to some policy or some issue. And once you take that position, it becomes an official position. And then people use that pro or con, depending on what their interests are. So I think you have to be very careful about what you support and how you support it, because it's gonna be used by other people for other reasons. Thank you, anyway, Larry. That's my input from Tom. Okay. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Any other comments, Hannah, from the public? And I see no other hands raised. Are we ready to move on to item number eight? And uh, Ariel, were you going to give an update on the Sonoma Valley CAC? Sure, I can do that really briefly. Um, I know that Matt was planning on being here and then he had a family obligation at the last minute. So. Um, at the May meeting, uh, they heard um, a presentation of the ad hoc of which Matt uh, Dickey is a part of their winery events guidelines um, that they had prepared. Um, they were a good deal stricter than the stakeholder group had recommended and it caused some consternation, but um, they were approved unanimously. If you would like to review those um, you can find them on the materials, uh, the SVCC materials, which is actually hosted by the city of Sonoma. So you can get to it if you Google SVCC and follow the links. Um, um, so I, the next step for that is it is going to go before the board of supervisors. Um, and those guidelines are, they are just guidelines and they are for SVCC to use when they're reviewing winery projects that they may review in the future. So um, they're not binding, they're not regulations, but they're, um, they're about things like minimum parcel size and, and parking and um, number of events per year, um, amplified music, setbacks, things like that. Um, and, and they, they put a lot of work into it and, and you know, whatever one might think about the, the content of them, it's a really lovely document that just really cleaned up the original version so much. And it's, it's, it's very, I'm, I'm very impressed with their work. Um, second, they heard an informational presentation from uh, Gary Halfrich from uh, Permit Sonoma about the upcoming vacation rental ordinance update. And that's actually something that he is going to give to this MAC as well, pending scheduling. Um, he's been a little difficult to get in touch with, but he uh, gave an informational presentation at SPCAC, and he plans to do that every MAC in the country, in the county, not the country. Um, so I know he's going before the Springs MAC, um, and essentially Permit Sonoma is updating their vacation, in, in the process of updating their vacation rental ordinance. Um, they're doing all the public outreach first, um, and they're going to go before the board, I think in July to start the conversation, but there's gonna be a series of public workshops to get public input. So he would like to use this as a venue as well um, to hear from you all as well as from the public. And then um, finally, there is no SVCAC meeting um, this month. It was canceled because we didn't have an agenda item, um, but VJB, the famous uh, or infamous um, Kenwood project is going before the planning commission. It is tentatively scheduled for July 22nd. That could change, but the public po uh, comment period is open now um, from now until July 8th. So if there's anyone who would like to review the materials or make public comment on um, VJB's application, um, and I think that they're, they're trying to um, get approvals to have a kitchen and, and some, I, it, it was, it's unclear to me, but um, I haven't reviewed the material because SVCAC heard it years ago. 
So, um, but you can get those materials from Blake Halligas or from planner at sonoma-county.org. Um, if anyone couldn't write that down, you can just reach out to me and I can connect you in the right place um, to get the information as well. Thank you, Ariel. Appreciate that. And uh, is there anyone who would like to speak to the Glen Ellen Forum? I don't believe we have a member. Oh, yes. Angela Narder Morgan, please. Um, you, so I was at the forum meeting and I'll just briefly uh, say that um, there were two guest speakers. One was Christian Pease, who spoke on the historic uh, cemetery project, which was started actually before the SEC closed and the state allotted them about $150,000 uh, there are almost 2,000 people in her beautiful sacred space, which is between, it's above where the SEC itself, all the buildings are, and below Fern Lake. So it's kind of right in the middle leading up to Jack London Park, if you haven't been there. Um, and um, they wanted to create a uh, memorial to honor those who, of course, are buried there, to honor the Native American and the First Peoples who were, who were part of this land. Um, and for those who are visiting and to create a place of reflection and remembrance and something for the ages that will exist in harmony with the surroundings. It needs to be ADA compliant so that people in wheelchairs and those who are disabled can get there. Um, they've already spent some money. They hired JD Chang, which is a, a firm that uh, looked at the design properties and they are creating a rectangular memorial and along the walls of that memorial will be all of the names of the people who are buried there. So you can come into this, the parking lot is across the road from it and you can come into this memorial, sit there and read all of these names. It, it really is a quite elegant and, and beautiful, the design of it. Um, there's over 7,000 feet, square feet um, that needs, to, needs an easement and um, they're looking for fundraising and budgets for that. And it was a really well, well delivered, wonderful presentation. And then the second presentation was on the drought and it was Barry from the Sonoma Water Agency it was basically the same presentation that Marcus gave today. Those you know, very dramatic pictures of the low levels of Lake Mendocino and Lake Sonoma, exactly the same material. So that was the forum presentations. Thank you very much. And now we're going to uh, the communications ad hoc. Is there anything from that group? We do have some updates. Um, we have the, the uh, coordinating with the Snow Valley Community Health Center for a vaccine uh, pop-up at Abbott's Passage Winery. And um, the, the clinic is um, presenting these vaccine pop-up events as a neighborhood fest where they have, uh, I guess, which is a FEMA program you can look up, but they uh, had one last night in the Springs by the movie theater on Highway 12 in Sonoma. And at the event, they have vaccines going on. They had um, firefighters there with a fire truck. They had a DJ there. They had a little bit of light food that was donated, chips and salsa by a restaurant. They had the art escape van um, with the activities, art activities for kids. They had a raffle where they raffled off a couple of um, gift cards to people. And then the Springs Mac was present with um, the emergency preparedness uh, ad hoc of the Springs Mac was there. They passed out go bags. They passed out evacuation zone maps. They had their um, map, my map my neighborhood leader there. Um, so it was really a great event it's great, they had over a hundred people get vaccinated and then they also had this opportunity to bring people together and um, get to know each other. And the MAC was able to provide some resources for emergency preparedness. So we would like to incorporate as many of those things as we can in our event. It's going to be on, uh, or on the next event that will be at Abbott's Passage on the 30th between, uh, June 30th between four and six. Um, so anybody who wants to help out with that or has ideas for that, please contact me and um, we can work to get to get that up and going. Um, also, 
there, uh, Arthur has arranged for us to have a table at the uh, 4th of July in Kenwood. And if he's looking for, we're looking for a few volunteers who'd be willing to staff the table. Um, he's gonna print out flyers with information about the MAC. It might be a great opportunity for, to get some more emergency preparedness resources in the hands of uh, local residents. And um, also we'll have sign-up sheets for anybody who wants to give us their email address to get some more information and reminders about MAC meetings. Thank you very much. You guys are very busy. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. Uh, preparedness, we've already had enough on that. I think traffic and safety ad hoc. Nothing from us except for an agenda suggestion, but I'll leave that till item nine. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Doss. And uh, others as appropriate, I don't know. Are there others out there? There might be. Consideration for future agenda items. We have three listed here and uh, Council Member Eagle, you have uh, something I think right off the top. Sure. So what we like, and I don't have a, a, a date suggestion, looks like we have a few things, uh, you know, that are going to take precedence as they get scheduled. Um, but we would like, we as the ad hoc, uh, uh, traffic and safety ad hoc, would really like to start looking at bike paths. I don't know if any of you saw the, there was an article in the Index Tribune uh, last Friday that sort of mapped out some of the various, there's the city, there's the state, you know, there's, there's, well, this, the state in, in terms of Caltrans um, roads like Highway 12, uh, you know, there, there's the Arnold Drive, which actually didn't get a mention in that article, but uh, Supervisor Gorn mentioned a few months ago. So we would like to sort of take advice from Supervisor Gorn and from Hannah and Ariel about a speaker on, on bike and multi-use path, multi paths um, and how we can move those forward uh, in, the, in the county. Any other items? We have the three items that are listed. Has anybody wanted to comment and kind of ask a quick question of Ariel? The first one is the permits. That's a fairly long presentation. Um, I would think it would be, uh, you know, who knows? But um, it, I know that when we were thinking about having this, uh, when it first came up and we were gonna try to do it next month, whatever that next month was, um, it was suggested that we, leave basically most of the meeting for it. Um, I can connect with Scott. He's the one who's gonna be, um, who's gonna be giving the presentation and kind of find out from him how long he thinks he's going to, to speak. I'm sure there'll be, hopefully we have a fuller back that night and we can, um, I'm sure a lot of you folks have a lot of questions. I'm also gonna ask that he talk about um, all the, the kind of projects that are hanging out there in the ether, just to provide an update. Um, and that was always the plan. I guess there's an online system that they're launching. So I think he was gonna use the projects that folks are interested in to kind of demonstrate it. Um, and also the, the, I think there's Glen Allen design guidelines. Um, and we might be able to also mention the Mayakamas uh, Sonoma Mountain design guidelines. I just had a meeting with them. So, so he's got a lot on his plate to cover. But, um, but so uh, yes, that's a lot of words to say. Yes, I think it will be long. And I also think that we have quite a few individuals, community members, who've expressed an interest in this presentation. So I think it would be uh, wise if we're if we're planning on having them in July. It would be wise for us not to preliminarily line up too many topics at that meeting because uh, tonight we're at two and a half hours right now, over two and a half hours. And it looked like a fairly light night to start the day. And so I think it'd be uh, difficult for us to do more than two or three other items and still have the permit Sonoma overview. Any comments from anybody? Uh, feelings in regards, because this is something we've kind of been pointing towards based upon community members and our own scheduling uh, for this presentation. Quick question, is Permit Sonoma, um, is that confirmed for July or potentially confirmed? Because that date isn't correct, right, for our next meeting? The date might not be correct, but they are confirmed for the July meeting. I don't think that is. I, I could be wrong, but I thought, I think that, okay. I don't have a calendar right in front of me. Okay, so but they, they are confirmed that, for July. They are, yes, they, they are confirmed. Thank you. 
So that's that's right. July twenty first is the third Wednesday. Oh, good. I thought it was the fourth. I, I I'm glad to hear that. I, I, thank you. Are there any other uh, questions in regards to future items for next month's meeting or other months? I mean, we some of the things that we've been bringing up, we may have to push off for a while. So uh, Hannah and Ariel, uh, you and Arthur and I will meet and put together and confirm, but uh, we're understanding that a large portion of next month's meeting is uh, permit Sonoma overview. Any other comments from council? Do I need uh, public comment on this? For agenda planning? I'm not seeing any, uh, any hands. Um, technically, you can take public comment, you, or you should offer it on every agenda item. Every item. Thank you very much. Well, item number 10, guess what, is adjourned. <laughs> Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Motion. May second. as second. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. Thank you all. Aye. Thank you all. We, we made it through. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Damon. Thank you, David, Thank you. for <laughs> leading us tonight. Great. Oh, yeah. Great to have you. Good night. Good night. Bye, all. Thank Bye. you.